going to get started. Welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim, and I'd like to welcome everybody to our infamous College of Complexes meeting. There are two rules to the College of Complexes. The first one is one fool at a time, and the second one is no personal attacks. Um, the format of the college consists of the following. We'll have a brief announcements period. Then we'll have a question and answer period. After our question and answer period, you'll get a chance to rebut the speaker through a certain specified a lot of time. For those of you who are new, we'll stick around till about nine o'clock or so and officially close the proceedings. I'll keep the Zoom call open in case any of you want to uh, uh, keep chatting about this later on. So without further ado, Charlie, I'm gonna let you start the announcements. And uh, Dan, if you're uh, ready to start your presentation, go ahead and share your screen and uh, let's get started. And again, I'd like to have everybody welcome uh, Dave. Okay, so uh, I'm ready to go. Okay, Dan, if you want to take that to a full screen, do you know how? Um, on, yeah. on, on the, uh, no, 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 not up there, on, 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 the, on the PowerPoint. Just, just click your mouse real quick one more time, because at the top, uh, where it says, uh, where it says, um, bear with me, it'll say slideshow right there. Just hover over that. Yeah, let me let me, uh, let me get my reading glasses on here. So uh, slideshow, it's it's like the third here. You see okay. where it says view and then review and it's slideshow. Right um. Here. It's it's on it's on that line where your mouse is at. Okay, you see where, all insert stray, whatever. Okay, so, so I, right. what am I what am I looking for, Tim? Slideshow to make your slideshow full screen. Okay, I guess I gotta have more up here because there's more. Okay. Slideshow, slide. hit click that with your mouse. No, no, no. You're 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 okay. All right. I'm looking at the top here. I I don't see uh slide. Oh, the next slide, the next line down. See where it has this home insert draw design. If you if you know what I'm saying, it's that line that says animations and slideshow and everything else. You just want to go to slideshow and then sit start from. The okay, beginning. well what I'm what I'm seeing here is stop video participants chat new share, pause share, um, annotate remote control apps and then more. Okay, click on the open area of your screen. Okay. All right. And what we'll do, okay, there's a way to start your slideshow and make it full screen. Um just just go to the top. You see you got that red that red line there, right below that red line. You see that that thing that says transitions? Got it, got it. Right there. Okay, got it. Now just hit start from the beginning. Um, um. <coughs> start all the way at the left all the way at the left okay now you just just go down and hit play from start you hit that button yeah yeah okay all right and what's going to happen is just use your space bar to advance i'm going to use the uh okay all right i see that down at the bottom okay you can also use your space bar on your keyboard to advance too okay all right so go ahead <laughs> Well, thank you uh, for giving me the assistance here. That's uh, <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, so uh, my name's Dan Vader. Uh, I worked in community mental health settings for about, well, for 23 years. Uh, I retired from the Chicago Department of Public Health towards the end of 2016. And uh, so, uh, I've, I've been doing uh, various mental health presentations periodically, and uh, this, this one on hoarding, I think, you, I hope you find it uh, helpful if any of you out there have a hoarding problem or you know of somebody who does. So uh, let, me, let me get this thing going. All right, so uh, the- Space part of advance. Um, what's that? Space bar on your keyboard will advance it. Yeah, yeah, I've got, okay. Let me just, just go over the uh, Batman situation here as an introduction. So we have here uh, 
uh, Batman's assistant is saying, do you really need all these versions of Batarangs? Can you get rid of this one? And Batman says, that's a flashbulb Batarang, indispensable. Next, he, this moldy <laughs> thing looks like it could go in the trash. And Batman says, that was my dad's, it stays. And then surely you can part with this. And Batman says, no, I, I might wear it again. So uh, Batman is a, is a hoarding problem. Okay, so, <laughs> um, okay, so uh, is, is it possible, Tim, for me to move the, uh, uh, you, you know, where you, I can see myself, you and, and Charles? And, and then, uh, we should have a, no, um, oh yeah, okay, I'm gonna minimize that, okay. All right, so, uh, okay, so th this is the uh, DSM-5 hoarding criteria. And, uh, you know, DSM is the Diagnostic Statistical Manual uh, for the, for psychiatry. And it's kind of dominates mental health uh, diagnosis and it has uh, really uh, in a big time way since 1980, even though the DSM has been, has been around, uh, I think maybe the first one was put out in 1952, and then they had a second version in 67. And those earlier versions were kind of from a, uh, a, a psychodynamic point of view. But this is DSM-5, which is from 2013. And so I'm just gonna go over this and, and point out a couple of things. Uh, so hoarding is defined in DSM-5 as a mental health disorder based on the following criteria. A, persistent difficulty discarding or parting with possessions, regardless of their actual value. B, this difficulty is due to a perceived need to save the items and stress associated with discarding them. So uh, let, me, let me just go up to this next slide. I want so criteria A and B, which I just read, describe an anxiety management problem. Okay. So C, the symptoms result in the accumulation of possessions that congest and clutter active living areas and substantially compromise their intended use. And that's a key one because, you know, it, it usually will manifest as, uh, it makes it difficult sometimes to use a kitchen or to get into the bathroom, that, that kind of thing in more uh, extreme cases. D, the hoarding causes clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. E, the hoarding is not attributable to another medical condition. Uh, the hoarding is not better explained by the symptoms of another mental disorder. Okay. And as I pointed out, criteria A and B, that just simply describes an anxiety management problem. Really straightforward. Criterion C, asserts you know, that the accumulated clutter has compromised the functionality of the home. Criterion D just says uh, that the inability to regulate the accumulation of clutter causes emotional pain and interferes with a person's ability to take care of their human needs. Um, criterion E factors out medical conditions such as a brain injury or a dementia which could precipitate hoarding behavior. Criterion F factors out other mental health disorders that could explain uh, hoarding behavior. Okay, and then we have the uh, hoarding specifiers. One, you know, which most hoarders are gonna have probably both of these, but uh, number one is excessive acquiring. Acquisition of unneeded items or lack of space to accommodate the acquired items. This occurs in part as an attempt to attenuate chronic emotional pain via interest, excitement, emotion. And I'm going to discuss that emotion uh, in some detail. Uh, number two, poor insight. 
This occurs when decisions have been made or beliefs have been formed which support the ongoing accumulation of things. The individual believes that keeping the hoard is necessary or that it is not problematic. Habituation to living in extreme clutter, squalor, also contributes to poor insight. In other words, you know, when, when you look at something like they show you on the reality TV hoarding stuff, where you see the, you know, some of the most extreme situations and, and somebody, you know, in the, usually in the beginning of those shows, somebody walks in, you know, a relative, a friend, they haven't been there in two years or five years, you know, and, and they go, oh my God, how could anybody live this way? But of course, the person who's been living there for years has become habituated to it. And they are no longer sensitive to the uh, hoard the way somebody from the outside would be. Okay. All right. Cognitive perceptual impairments associated with hoarding. Impaired attention. Impaired attention leads to decision-making and categorization problems. Impaired attention frequently represents <clears throat> a mechanism to avoid emotional pain. Impaired sensitivity to the clutter and or squalor is a consequence of normal habituation processes like I just mentioned. All right, so risk assessment when you're dealing with uh, hoarding. Uh, I've, I've, you know, health problems caused by germs, allergens, slash dust, insect and or rodent infestation. Safety problems such as blocked exits, structural damage, and fire hazards. And, uh, you know, a lot of times in, in these hordes, especially with people who like to save a lot of newspapers, you know, uh, and, and it's all over the place, it really can be quite a, a fire hazard. Uh, legal, pro especially if the person smokes, for example, legal problems such as eviction, liability lawsuits, or loss of custody of a child. You know, family marital problems such as divorce, separation, or other cutoffs. Financial problems associated with public storage units, which I'm gonna go into a little bit. Uh, uh, and then problems associated with these risks need to be addressed by the appropriate agencies. So here we have uh, a photograph. This is a indoor hoard. It's a, you know, you can see it's a kitchen and it has uh, considerable clutter and, and uh, may not be really even usable. Here's a, a slide of an outdoor hoard uh, where you know it's the neighbors don't appreciate this kind of a hoard, uh, and it can lead to clearly uh, uh, you know bad feelings with with neighbors. Here we have the public storage hoard, and and I, I you, you know when I was working and and I would be dealing with uh, people who were on a fixed income, maybe they had social security disability income. Maybe they had SSI income, some sort of fixed income that really didn't give them a whole lot of money. And they would put their belongings frequently into one of these public storage type units. And that would take a considerable portion of their money to, to support it. And I got to say, you know, public companies like public storage and uh, the, these companies, they know exactly how people are. They know once they put them in there, the chances are really good. It's just going to stay there and stay there until the person may, maybe uh, uh, dies or, or simply can't afford it anymore and it gets auctioned off. So it's a problem out there. Um, this next one, I, I uh, this is, I, included this here because uh, I want to tell a little story about when I worked for public health. Uh, so this was the British Petroleum Coke Brothers Pet Coke Hoard in the 10th Ward. And, and this was a big pile of pet coke that was a problem 
back in you know 2014, 2015, that, that time frame. And fortunately that's been taken care of. But again, it, it just kind of represents uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, inability to responsibly manage this hoard of pet coke and then and ultimately the, the hoarding of the money that uh, occurs very, very often. So uh, what happened was I, I gave a version of this back in 20, uh, 2015 uh, and I had uh, gotten the green light from public health to do it. I gave a presentation, it went really well at one of our libraries. And then I had a presentation scheduled out at the East Side Library out in the 10th Ward. And uh, people were definitely uh, wanting to have a little conversation about this pet coke hoard. So uh, when I gave my first, uh, when I gave my presentation, and which I had the green light for, after I gave it, I was called by the public information uh, officer at public health. And the, they told me right away that I should not talk to any media. And there was, you, you know, the, the original hoarding presentation was part of a task force in the, uh, in the 48th and 49th ward. Uh, and, and it got a pretty good turnout. So, but I was told, do not talk to anybody in the media. And then the public information officer wanted to ask me, the only thing they really wanted to know is what did I say about this slide? <laughs> and uh, because, you know, this slide was uh, something that was disrespectful to British Petroleum <laughs> Koch brothers. And that's, that's the way public health operates essentially you know that there, there's always going to be a bowing down to corporate interests public health always in in a uh, situations like this will generally be bowing down to corporate interests now that recently may have changed somewhat okay so the common hoarding task force agencies you know there's a lot of them housing public health mental health, protective services, aging service uh, services, legal services, medical services, fire and police, animal control, professional organizers, professional house cleaners. Now it costs a lot of money, by the way, to get an organizer, uh, like you see in the you know ho hoarding reality stuff, you have an organizer uh, who's gonna help the person decide what to throw away, what to say, what to sell, Etc. cetera. Uh, and then you have the professional house cleaners if it's a really serious thing. And again, it can cost uh, five to 10 grand depending on what the situation is. Okay, so the hoarder demographic profile. Hoarders frequently have a history of abuse and trauma. This may lead to emotional support and community involvement problems. Now I'm gonna talk again about emotional support and community involvement. Overall prevalence of hoarding in the United States and Europe is approximately two to 6%. You know, I, latest figures might be a little different. Uh, prevalence of hoarding is inversely related to household income. So the, the more uh, financial stress somebody is under, uh, the more likely they're, they're gonna hoard. Uh, and, you know, and, and there's a common sense aspect to that. Uh, hoarding, hoarding is correlated with lower socioeconomic status. Hoarders are frequently retired or unemployed. Hoarding is thought to be three times as common in the middle aged and elderly. Okay, so I'm going to uh, talk here about hoarding as a need deficiency problem. And, and by, you know, need, I'm talking about our needs as human beings. <laughs> you know, we have to have our basic needs taken care of 
or we're going to suffer considerable emotional problems and pain. So the, the hoarder demographic profile implies the frequent occurrence of key need, uh, human need deficiencies. Need deficiencies can include financial instability, poor emotional support, lack of community involvement, and neglected individual development. Need deficiencies generate chronic emotional pain, usually a mixture drawn from the negative emotions of anxiety, sadness, shame, and anger. Emotional pain is instinctive and, and very similar to physical pain. I mean, we all understand emotional pain. We don't care for it. And uh, people will do many, many things to uh, get rid of it. So chronic emotional pain, I, wa I wanna, uh, chronic emotional pain differs from everyday emotional pain. It is independent of the vicissitudes of everyday events. Now we have everyday pain, you know, emotional pain. Um, you know, I'm waiting for a bus, it doesn't come, I get frustrated, you know, somebody insults me, things happen day to day. Uh, and, and we get emotional pain from that. But chronic emotional pain is going to be there as long as our human needs are not adequately addressed and taken care of. Chronic emotional pain is associated with our hardwired emotional adaptation to small group tribal living situations. If the sources of chronic emotional pain are not remediated or partially anesthetized, the probability of an emotional breakdown occurring is high. And I made, uh, you know, and, and most people sense that if they are constantly under emotional pain, uh, they're gonna probably fall apart. And, and again, nobody wants to fall apart and you, nobody wants to have a full blown breakdown which can end in, in very unfortunate ways. And, and, and if the sources of chronic emotional pain are not removed, hoarding behavior will easily reemerge. In other words, there'll be a relapse of the hoarding behavior unless the uh, need deficiencies which cause chronic emotional pain are taken care of. And uh, therapy may help somebody address the needs. Uh, case management could help somebody directly uh, do something about their needs. Uh, medication can, to some degree, if it works, uh, partially anesthetize the emotional pain that somebody would feel, but it's not going to do anything about taking care of the needs, the medication. Okay, let's see here. Okay, so uh, need deficiencies in consciousness, and, and, and I just want to uh, go over this. I do this in uh, most of my presentations, regardless of the subject. Uh, the, the conscious mind is rooted in the modern world. It is very aware of modern technology, hospitals, supermarkets, food banks, homeless shelters, and telephone numbers. The conscious not mind knows we can call 911 if we are sick. It knows an ambulance will transport us to the hospital and doctors and nurses will look after us. This is how I'm def uh, defining the conscious mind for purposes here. The unconscious mind is rooted in a hunting, gathering, foraging world, a tribal world consisting of families banded together. It is not aware of the modern world. The unconscious mind constantly monitors our drive states, you know, hunger, thirst, etc., and our thoughts to determine if our human needs are being met. If the unconscious perceives that our needs are being inadequately attended to, it will transmit emotional pain into our consciousness. So we have the un unconscious mind checking out uh, uh, what kind of shape are our human needs at, at, at a given point in time. 
and uh, it's it's the it is not aware of the modern conveniences that we have. Hopefully, we don't lose them. Uh, okay, so now uh, in uh, sorry about that. Okay, so. Uh, I generally go over four human needs, but for purposes of this, and just because of time considerations, I'm only going over two, and, and probably the two that are most relevant to hoarding problems. So human need uh, for an emotional support system. An adequate emotional support system is in place if you are- And if, and if you wanna go over a little bit more, we can go a little over an hour if you'd like. Okay, great, Tim. That that. That would, that would be good. I might have to go over a little bit, even with this attenuated version that I prepared here. Uh, and an adequate uh, emotional support system is in place if you are attached slash bonded to four to six individuals with whom there is a mutual obligation to help one another if either you or the other person is sick, injured, or in great distress. You know, reciprocity is a key here. And, and these individuals uh, who are in, in a mo you know, if you start going down from four people, you know, three, two, one, zero, it gets much more serious <clears throat> in terms of the emotional pain that someone's gonna feel. Once you get past six, you know, seven, eight, but it does, it, there's kind of a ceiling effect. It really doesn't have much of a benefit. But the key here is again, reciprocity. You know, you, you have people who are willing to help you and you are willing to help them if they're in need. Now, the, the unconscious mind does not care who is in your emotional support system. Any combination of significant other, family members, friends, and associates is acceptable. If the unconscious perceives your emotional support is weak or absent, it will generate chronic emotional pain, usually a combination of anxiety and loneliness slash sadness. Okay. The second human need I'm gonna go over is, is the need for community involvement. And of course, hoarders are frequently totally cut off from community involvement and usually have a pretty inadequate emotional support system. Now, community involvement is in place if you are a contributing member of a group cooperating together in order to achieve a goal or carry out a mission. The unconscious mind doesn't care what kind of community involvement you have. It just cares that you have one in place. It is as satisfied with street gang or organized crime activity as it is with civic-minded pursuits. Obviously, you know, it's better to be involved with civic-minded pursuits, but the unconscious on this level doesn't really care. If the unconscious perceives that community involvement is absent, it will generate chronic emotional pain, usually a combination of anxiety and shame. All right, now, I've kind of mentioned this a little bit, but three outcomes that result from chronic emotional pain and emotional breakdown. And when you have a full-blown emotional breakdown, that usually means if you're lucky, you end up in a psychiatric unit somewhere, if you're lucky. Uh, you may end up incarcerated because you break the law as you break down. You may ruin relationships as you go through your full-blown breakdown. And you may end up committing suicide as you go through your emotions. So nobody wants to have that kind of uh, full-blown breakdown. Uh, they, it just doesn't end well. So what mostly happens is evolution of a lifestyle such as hoarding devoted to partially anesthetizing the chronic emotional pain. Now, clearly, people can use drugs, they can use comfort food, they can drink, they can smoke cigarettes, 
I mean, there's just, a, you know, gamble, there's, there's all sorts of things. Uh, look at pornography. There's all sorts of things that people can do to anesthetize chronic emotional pain to save themselves from having a full-blown breakdown. And in certain communities that are living in near poverty or poverty, that means that a significant number, uh, you know, obviously of people living there are suffering chronic financial instability. And they, that, that gives chronic emotional pain. So you can't be surprised in communities that are like that, that people, you know, they drink, they use drugs, they do a bunch of things to prevent them from having a full-blown breakdown. Now, the remediation of the need deficiencies uh, that uh, generate chronic emotional pain, that's the way to go. And whether it's hoarding or you know, anything else, try to get those things taken care of. And, and uh, you know, people may not believe it, or they, but if you don't get this taken care of, these need deficiencies, you're going to be very, very vulnerable to mental health disorders or problems or whatever you want to call them. Okay, now I'm going to go over hoarding is an emotion management problem. And you know, the need deficiencies kick up emotional pain. So hoarding problems are mediated by the maladaptive management of interest slash excitement and anxiety. Interest excitement, which I'm going to go into, can anesthetize emotional pain. Anxiety, which we, you know, leads to the avoidance or escape from emotional pain. Obviously, some activities which produce interest excitement can also be conceptualized as avoidance escape behaviors. Once a hoarding pattern of behavior has been established, the maladaptive management of other emotions such as sadness and shame can constrain the implementation of solutions to the problem. Now in terms, I could go into sadness and shame, but there's no time for that given the, the constraints here. It is important to note that any significant emotion management problems will interfere with or prevent the, the removal of need deficiencies. So, you know, if somebody, is constantly, let, let's say they have a problem managing their anger. Uh, well, if you have an anger management problem, that may make it hard for you to have a good emotional support system because people don't want to be around you because you're explosive. You, you know, you have a short fuse. Uh, it's hard to be in a community involvement if you have an anger management problem because, uh, you know, you may go off on people and they're just, they don't want you uh, to be part of them. Uh, so, you, you know, it, it's very, very important to uh, uh, address the emotions. So somebody who's a hoarder uh, would need to get their need deficiencies cleared up with assistance, but it has to be cleared up as best as possible. And then they need to be able to manage these emotions both of those things. Okay, so here's a diagram of interest excitement. I, I, interest means a low level of this emotion. Excitement means a very high level of it. And, and I just do, I do the interest slash excitement out of respect for uh, uh, somebody, uh, Sylvan Tompkins, who was a psychologist at Princeton way back in the 40s, 50s, it goes way back. But, but he was kind of a pioneer with, with emotions. Uh, and so interest excitement, at the top of the diagram, we have three things that cause us to experience interest excitement. Goals, things that we're trying to achieve. Novelty, you know, something new comes before us, you know, and, and then the drives. Hunger, thirst, sex, affection, intimacy, and all the acquired addictions, alcohol, drugs, et cetera. They just become like drive, you know, just like drive state. Then we, you, you experience interest excitement. And when you're in an interest excitement state, whatever it is you're looking at, the object is perceived as all good, 
all important, all necessary, totally positive. Uh, and the, at the same time, uh, there's a disregard for negative consequences. In other words, if interest excitement is the emotion that is dominating the mind brain at a given point in time, then you're not gonna be experiencing shame and anxiety. And shame and anxiety are the two emotions that allow us to really consider consequences for our behavior. And what interest excitement is trying to do, it wants to focus attention and urges acquisition and exploration of the object. And, and we, you know, and it feels good. It's associated with the neurotransmitter dopamine. And, and uh, it makes us feel pretty good. And, and it's a good way to, you know, you, you maybe you're stressing out about something. Let me turn on the TV and watch Netflix or some ball game or something, you know. And, and that can, if you can become engaged, interested in that, temporarily you, you can overcome the negative uh, emotions you're experiencing. So. Okay, so just, you know, again, it, interest, excitement, it's the positive emotion we feel when we are focused on accomplishing a goal or acquiring something we desire. Yeah, as I said, interest less intense, excitement more intense. The emotion energizes us to acquire or explore the object of our attention. Interest, excitement, as I said, is triggered by drive states, goals, novelty, generates automatic thoughts, that the focus of attention is all positive, all important, or all necessary. Uh, and, you know, like, like with drug addiction, you know, in the beginning, the drug is kind of all positive. Uh, and then at a certain point, it becomes all necessary. Uh, generates automatic thoughts, which disregard or minimize the potential negative consequences that can follow interest, excitement, generated action, and there's all sorts of things, you know, people end up buying something they really can't afford. They make, they go ahead and do that. Uh, or they get in trouble because, you know, they're at it someplace and they start flirting with somebody and that leads to uh, uh, maybe a, a sexual encounter. And, and so, you know, people when they're in a, a high interest excitement state uh, can make some really bad moves because they're cut off from being able to think about the consequences of what it is they're getting ready to do. Okay, so now, so let's see if we, okay, let me, let me go back more here. Okay, so here, here's an interest excitement timeout kind of modeled on, you know, like an anger timeout and, you know, take sufficient time for the anticipatory excitement enthusiastic arousal to subside. And, and as I go through this, you know, think of a hoarder because hoarders are really motivated by interest, excitement, emotion. While on the timeout, calibrate the automatic thoughts that accompany the feeling. Remind yourself that the focus of your attention may be rewarding, but it is not nearly as positive as it feels. Also remind yourself of any negative consequences that could occur if you act on the feeling. And this is something which people who are hoarders have to learn and they need to practice it. Uh, it it's very important. Okay, second emotion uh, is anxiety that I'm, that I'm going over. And anxiety is what we experience in response to any kind of a future threat. And that future threat usually boils down to emotional or physical pain. And, and so when, when you go into an anxiety state, um, you have two types of thoughts. Uh, you have catastrophic thoughts, you know, which are worst case scenarios, like, you know, maybe uh, uh, if, if I, uh, catch COVID, uh, they're going to be, you know, I'm going to be at a funeral, my own funeral very soon. Uh, worst case scenarios, uh, you know, kind of a thing. And, and uh, inefficacy thoughts, inefficacy means, you know, kind of non-coping thought, you know, I can't cope, it's too much for me. 
So anxiety gives you these automatic thoughts in order to incentivize you to avoid something or escape from something. Okay, so just as I said, the emotion, it, it, it's in response to future threats, wants us to avoid or escape. It gives us the automatic thoughts of a catastrophe and that we couldn't possibly bear under the negative outcome from the threat. And it wants us to avoid or escape. Uh, when we decide to avoid a threat, we usually experience immediate relief. All right. Now here's the here's an anxiety timeout. Let me get my reading glasses on for the. the so here's what has to happen uh, with an anxiety timeout. You have to ask yourself whether the threat is avoidable or not. That's the first thing, and and it could be no or it could be yes. If the threat is avoidable, yes, then we're going to have either an adaptive avoidance, something that's a good avoidance or a maladaptive avoidance, something that is not a good choice. So if it's an adaptive avoidance, it prevents unnecessary harm from the threat. If it's a maladaptive avoidance, we may avoid goals and responsibilities and miss out on opportunities. And a lot of anxiety management is really focused on things that are avoidable you know, and it could be maladaptive or adaptive. Now, if the answer is no, the threat is not avoidable, um, then we have to go to, uh, can you endure, since you can't get away from the threat and the emotional and or physical pain you're gonna get from that threat, can you endure the negative outcome? Or maybe you cannot endure the negative outcome, if you cannot endure the negative outcome, it's likely to give you a minor physical or emotional breakdown. If you can endure the negative outcome, the pain, uh, you know, then you can tell yourself you can deal with it and prevent a breakdown process. And, and generally speaking, you have, to, you have to rehearse and you have to think about this. Uh, uh, you know, what, what is, you know, is the threat avoidable or not? For example, uh, just, just quickly, you know, if, if uh, I frequently use this example, if uh, I'm having pain in, in, you know, my abdomen and it doesn't go away, I might start to fantasize that I have cancer. And of course, I'm going to have to get it diagnosed. Hopefully I won't avoid getting it diagnosed. But the, the issue is if I have, let's say terminal cancer, I really can't avoid the ultimate negative outcome. And if I don't wanna break down before I pass out, before I die, then I need to be able to uh, uh, have coached myself and rehearsed how you know, I'm gonna handle things until the end. And, and uh, so let me, let's move here. Okay. This, this is the third, so we, with a hoarder, they've got to get those need deficiencies taken care of. And, and uh, it's just something that is, is essential. They have to be able to manage anxiety and interest excitement particularly, but they also have to learn to manage, you know, sadness and shame too. Uh, so here, here is something that is often overlooked. And this is belief decisions constitute symptom maintenance factors. When a decision is made or a belief is formed, consciousness is altered in the following ways. One, consciousness is granted easy access to information that supports the decision or belief. Consciousness is denied easy access to information that contravenes, goes against, the decision or belief. If information that contravenes the decision or belief enters consciousness, it is usually rejected via rationalization or minimization. Emotionally driven beliefs decisions are frequently maladaptive and occasionally delusional. Emotionally driven beliefs decisions 
contribute to the poor insight that uh, characterizes hoarding. Now, uh, just just to uh, uh, you know, some of you may be familiar with uh, you know the concept or the framework of cognitive dissonance, and, yeah. and th this is very very similar. What I'm putting out here to uh, cognitive dissonance theory. Uh, so let's go here. So here we have uh, some examples of interest excitement driven maladaptive beliefs that hoarders would have. My items are too beautiful and or valuable to be discarded. My items will facilitate the achievement of you know, some future goal. My items will preserve my memories of loved ones. Wow. My items will, be, will prove to be useful in the future. They have use value. My items improve my status. These are uh, interest, excitement driven, maladaptive uh, uh, beliefs. Now, here are some anxiety driven, maladaptive beliefs for hoarders and, and others. It is not tolerable to make a mistake or fail. It is not tolerable to make a wrong decision. It is not tolerable to waste or lose valuable information. It is not tolerable to break an attachment to acquired items. You know, some acquired items possess sentimental value associated with loved ones. Others, such as dolls, stuffed animals, and old toys are ascribed human attributes, and you get attached to, to those, those items. Uh, it is not tolerable to dispose of an item that possesses use value. Okay, so we're going to conclude this quickly here. Here is a summary of, of hoarder motives. Acquiring items produce, produces positive emotional energy, the interest excitement, and anesthetizes emotional pain, anxiety, shame, sadness. The pleasure associated with interest excitement is very reinforcing. It's a real dopamine rush. Uh, just fantasizing about the acquisition of items produces positive emotional energy and anesthetizes emotional pain. Hoarders experience emotional pain when they contemplate the loss of an item that still has use value. Throwing away an item that has use value is frequently viewed as unethical. Hoarders can associate their stuff with their identity. I am what I possess type of thing and the preservation of important memories. Hoarding objects trigger these memories and the thought that if they lose these objects, their memories and sense of self will also become diminished or lost. Hoarders frequently form strong attachment to their items and feel that it is intolerable to reject or abandon the items. Instinctive anxiety produces automatic thoughts that identify the potential pain as being severe and unbearable. These thoughts are meant to facilitate avoidance uh, escape actions. Finally, hoarding treatment options. So uh, cognitive behavioral approaches, kind of similar to some of the things I'm talking about here. Uh, cognitive behavioral approaches can help remediate emotion management and maladaptive belief problems that promote hoarding behaviors. However, it is also important to remove human need deficiencies that generate chronic emotional pain. 12-step oriented self-health groups can remediate emotion management and maladaptive belief problems. Participation in these groups can also remove the, the need deficiencies. You know, you automatically, when you're in a 12-step group, you automatically uh, have an emotional support system, and you automatically have uh, community involvement. You all have a goal to overcome the problems that you're addressing. Uh, professional organizers and other educators can teach hoarders strategies that will improve their ability to create and maintain a livable environment. Case management services can facilitate 
the effective utilization of community resources that help ameliorate aid deficiencies. Psychiatric medication, if it is effective, will reduce the intensity of the emotional pain hoarders experience. However, medication creates tolerance and side effect problems and cannot remediate need deficiencies. And someone can argue, well, if you take the medication, maybe then you'll, you'll be able to do something about the need deficiencies, perhaps. But you first have to understand what these need deficiencies really are. Uh, uh, and, and they're hardwired on an unconscious level. So, okay, that is, uh, that's it. And uh, so I'm gonna stop the share, right, Tim? Right. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna stop the share. Okay. All right, I'm, I'm here and uh, Lana has been calling me for the last few hours trying to get logged in. If somebody could call her and help her out, but I can't deal with this right now. It's just, my, fo my phone's off. All right, anyway, my apologies, please. Okay, we're now under our... Can everybody hear me, first of all? Just raise your hand. Okay, good. I'm sorry. I was having some trouble here with the computer. All right. <coughs> we're now into our infamous question and answer period. Um, and I know we got Margaret with a... And, of course, excuse me a minute. I'm going to silence this phone real quick because... I'm having trouble with a chronic, not a troll, but a chronic person having to think she can interrupt our meetings all the time. Good old Lana has been at it again. She's got a new computer and can't log into Zoom, you know, supposedly. All right. Uh, I'd like to ask the first question, Dan. Um, I know you've gone through a lot of hoarding, uh, hoarding exercises and things. Do you think that programs on the History Channel, like, uh, uh, what is it? American pickers and things will contribute a lot to the hoarding problem or even like the program that's on called Hoarders. Um, can you just comment on those real quick? Then we'll get into questions. And yeah, then what, I got what was the first uh, program you mentioned? It's called American pickers where they drive around a country and they see all these hordes of items everywhere. And yeah. Oh my God, I'll give you money for that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, so any of that, you know, you know, the, the, the hoarder, you know, you can, it's, it's almost like uh, the, the hoarder wants to, uh, we all understand what it's like, you know, if, if you're window shopping or you're looking at Amazon or, or this kind of thing that gives you interest, excitement, emotion, you know, the hoarder wants to have new items if possible, or, you know, let, let's, let me go down the alley and see what's out there. There's a lot of stuff people throw away that have great use value. And while they're doing this collecting, uh, gathering of items, they are experiencing interest, excitement, emotion. And, and they see what it is they're looking at, again, as I said, as being, you know, all good, all important, all necessary. And, and they're not thinking about the consequences of creating a hoard. Now, you know, as far as, um, uh, you, you know, and look, people can be collectors. You know, you can collect things. I've got a stamp collection, a coin collection, baseball card collection, you know, this or that. You have your collections, but those are generally organized to a certain degree and under control. But... Uh, the hoarding problem is usually, you know, it's pretty messy and, and it creates all these problems that we all understand. Uh, so, yeah, I, I don't know how, you know, that I wouldn't say it really contributes to it, uh, in, in, but uh, it, it could with some individuals, of course. Okay. Um, now I got four people with questions right now. So I got Margaret, Vicki, Karina, and Ernie. Margaret, please go first. I'll lower your hand and uh, let's keep this interesting conversation going. Yeah, I, I would like to uh, understand why you put in the, the slide about the Koch brothers uh, pet Coke uh, thing that blew up all over the 10th Ward and is a, definitely a factor in, uh, are you accusing the Koch brothers of, of hoarding 
pet coke or, or what, what <laughs> no I, I i i understand what you're in 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 uh, uh again the, the the time constraints of, of presenting something at the college uh you know i sometimes when i would do this i i at a period of time i'd show uh, uh a photograph of donald trump uh, <laughs> as, as an example of you know hoarding money and and of course uh the the coke brother the you know these corporations Koch brothers, British Petroleum, basically were about hoarding money. The pet Coke was was kind of part of that, and and it was damaging. It was like if you lived in the tenth ward when you had that pet Coke hoard, as I'm calling it, it was blowing all throughout the neighborhood and getting people sick. It's kind of analogous to to uh, somebody with an outdoor hoard that's you know overflowing to their neighbor's house. That, that's why I had it. Plus, I, I like to uh, be able to uh, say a little bit about how uh, Chicago Department of Public Health uh, was in terms of that particular slide and, and uh, so on. That, that's why. Hey, you, um, okay, Vicki, you got the next question. Unmute, Vicki. I wasn't able to keep up with the density of the material with my note taking, and I want to hoard your words. So if there's any way I can get a print out of this, or if it's, I still have uh, your handout from the depression talk, I believe that you oh. get. Yeah, yeah. Uh, your visuals are really, it in did. addition to the talk you can yeah. email that to me and we can put it in a form of a pdf for her to print it out and if it yeah that, I, i'll do that i'll i'll send thank some, you send yes definitely you can sure. put your one, address in the chat later on one problem with the virtual but um because <laughs> oh. thank you okay um anything else vicky any any other um, questions do I have any other questions? Uh, okay, okay. Um, yeah, you know, when you first talked about anesthetizing, uh, my first instinct was, well, how do I go about anesthetizing this? But uh, the behavior, the maladaptive behavior is the anesthetic I'm finding. And yet I've suffered depression and anxiety for decades and, dealing with it moderately um need some quicker fixes here <laughs> so, so so you you know here, here's something which is uh not well understood within the whole institution of of mental health in a way you know the the services um so what what you do look what what happens is uh nobody likes anxiety nobody likes shame nobody likes sadness you know and etc anxiety but we live within a paradigm where psychiatry the institution of psychiatry dominates mental health and what psychiatrists provide for mental health problems is medication. Way back in the day, of course, they did talk therapy. They pretty much stopped that as we rolled into the mid to late 70s because you know there were other therapists coming online. Psychologists were first and then social workers and then later others. Uh, and what they found was that uh, the non-MD providers of therapy could do just as good a job as the psychiatrists. And the psychiatrists were threatened in terms of making a living. And so in night by 1980, when they came out with the Diagnostic uh, Statistical Manual number three, they went over to a medical biomedical model so that they could prescribe medications and you know have a monopoly on that and you know and then what kind of happened was well you know so uh 
therapy is helpful, case management is helpful, but they're just kind of from a psychiatric point of view, they're almost adjunctive. The medication's the big deal. And, and uh, the, the, the problem is, uh, look, anybody theoretically can learn to manage uh, interest, excitement, emotion, any of the emotions, but they don't really teach that. Now, some therapy, some uh, methods of therapy will really do some of that. But, uh, you know, generally speaking, uh, everybody can learn. If you're a hoarder, you do have to learn to manage those emotions, but you also need to understand the concept of chronic emotional pain. If, you know, if you're living in circumstances where you do not have an adequate emotional support system, or you're not involved in community activities, if you are near poverty or worse, you're going to suffer chronic emotional pain. That's not going to go away uh, unless those deficiencies are removed. And a lot of times, again, people aren't even taught that on, in any sense. I, I mean, everybody understands that, you know, if, if, you, if you're poor, uh, uh, you're, you're in a, a situation where you're going to feel miserable a lot of the time. And, and that's going to give you that chronic emotional pain. The, the unconscious mind, as I'm talking about it today, it, its goal is, you know, if, if, you did, if you were living in a hunting gathering uh, group, very small group of people, families banded together, and, and you were not somebody who was uh, able to reciprocate to others when they needed help and they did the same for you back before we had, you know, modern technology, you know, doctors, hospitals, et cetera, you would simply die. You would die if you didn't have the people around you to help you, help you heal, or maybe sometimes to have to carry you somewhere. Uh, and so the unconscious mind is tuned into that. And therefore, even though today, look, a lot of hoarders become isolated. They stay to themselves and, and they have very little interaction. Now that means they're, and, and usually they've, they've had problems with family and friends because of the hoarding problem. And therefore, generally speaking, they're going to be uh, with inadequate emotional support or community involvement. That means they're constantly having this chronic emotional pain and by going out and you know, doing the hoarding, uh, they can partially anesthetize uh, that pain. And that's what they do. Uh, uh, so it, when, when we're looking at mental health, uh, a lot of things have to be taken care of. And as long as you know, uh, psychiatry uh, continues to uh, be in control, essentially, of what goes on with mental health. And of course, the pharmaceutical corporations fund a lot of advocacy organizations that either recommend medication or they kind of soft pedal it. And I, and I do acknowledge that there are a small group of people who definitely could benefit from medication in certain situations. And sometimes somebody has really uh, severe organic uh, problems that really are more neurological than even psychiatric. And yes, they may need to take medication in order to be able to function at, at a certain level. But most people don't really need it. So. Thank you. I appreciate your focus on the emotional pain and on the community involvement. Okay. I want to say what I said after your last talk, and that's that I'm sorry you're retired, actually. <laughs> okay. you, you, you could be very useful, so have him back, please. Well, I think, hey, I think in his retirement, with him giving time for presentations, he may prove useful yet. All right, mm -hmm. I've got Karina, I've got Ernie, I've got Bob, I've got Charles, and FRJ. Is that Father Ja, or uh, how do you want me to pronounce your name, sir? Okay. All right, uh, I'll just put Father Yah. And uh, so again, Karina, Ernie, Bob, Charles, and Father Yah. All right, Karina, um, 
Karina Gaster, you're uh, next on mute. And, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. And uh, your time for questions now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you, uh, you, you touch upon the hoarding as being emotional and that people need therapy and medication. But what about situational hoarding? For example, and that when the situation changes, the hoarding could stop. For example, like somebody who's fired from a job. Oh, I've got a hoard. I've got to make everything stretch as long as I can uh, because of the economic consequences. But then, bingo, he gets a new job. And then, you know, there was a necessity goes. Can people cure themselves from hoarding through a better change in circumstance. Yeah, well, uh, you know, so generally, um, yeah, I, I believe that uh, anybody can cure themselves of a hoarding problem if, if the right uh, considerations are in place. Now, the situation that you're talking about, you know, where, uh, you know, I, I, I lost my job, why I've got to try to, you know, save everything that I have, or I need, you know, I may need this down the road in case I don't get employment again. That is situational to use your term. And, and uh, yeah, you know, if the situation disappears, the person will not be so motivated in that survival type way to hoard. However, um, if, if that person uh, creates problems for themselves, you know, so uh, the, the uh, house or the apartment where they live is no longer functional. It, it becomes, you know, the, even if it is situational, as you say, and, and uh, it's still going to be a problem. They don't, you know, you know that, that I, I've had situations where uh, uh, I remember one situation where somebody uh, called me up because they knew, you know, I knew something about hoarding. And they said, uh, you know, I've got a real problem here. Could you come over? And, and I went over to their place. And uh, uh, it, it was a pretty, uh, it was, wasn't one of the worst hoards I've ever seen, but it, it was significant. And uh, somebody who was living there was sick. And they needed to, you know, get an ambulance in there. And they were wow. terrified that if the fire department showed up, uh, they'd you know, be kicked out of their apartment or cited or something of that nature. So uh, very, very quickly, we kind of moved some stuff around so that it was easy enough for the uh, paramedics to come in and take a person out. Uh, and, and, you know, so... Uh, once a place is no longer functional or, or it's a fire hazard, um, it, it, you know, is, is really dangerous and uh, people have to uh, be able to understand that on some level. And usually, uh, again, you know, uh, uh, if somebody, for example, has, you know, all over their floor newspapers all over the place, and, you know, when I would encounter something like that, I, you know, I'd say, this is a fire hazard you've got here. You need, you know, there's people who live above you. Uh, yeah, it's true. You don't smoke, but somebody could be in here or something else could happen. And, and this place would really go up. And, and you, you know, you can't be endangering your neighbors because you have this newspaper hoard uh, in, in your place. So the, the functionality and the, and the danger are things that, again, the hoarder has to, uh, in, in a sense, be confronted with those kind of realities at, at a given point in time. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. I see. I see. All right. Thank you. Okay, that's good. Thank you, Karina. Now I've got Ernie, Bob, Charles, Father Yah, and Ellen Corley. So, uh, and then Karina Schuschenheim added to the list. So. Right, right now we've got six people in line waiting for the question. So Ernie, you're next. Yeah, uh, a very, very simple question. Do you uh, have a difference between a hoarder and a pack rat? <laughs> well, 
Well, I don't know exactly what you mean by a pack rat. They're probably, you know. Uh, I, I admit to being a pat rat. I pack rat. I won't admit to being a hoarder. Well, if 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 your uh, if your living uh, situation is functional, I mean, it, you know that that's not a problem, uh, mm -hmm. particularly, uh, you, you know. And if if your uh, house or apartment is not keeping people away yeah you, you know that you you might want to socialize with that kind of thing it, it's it really isn't uh a problem i would say okay yeah. okay thanks yeah. all right um i guess bob matter you're next bob matter you're next unmute <clears throat> okay dan uh, <clears throat> some years ago i think i saw a uh an article or website or something that showed uh, some brain scans of hoarders, and uh, they they all had uh, some uh, you know there was some uh, area of the brain there that had some irregular color you know that wasn't like normal brains. Uh, what what do you know about that? Well, okay, so I I don't know uh, uh, much about that. What what you're referencing. But I, I would say this, that uh, imaging studies of the brain uh, concerning psychiatric or mental health issues mostly aren't very reliable or a lot of times not even valid, you know, at all. Uh, and, and we, you know, again, we, we, I think it's important to remember the, the realities of mental health. Uh, which is that uh, the pharmaceutical corporations and psychiatry, which essentially dominate mental health. Uh, it's very clear and they have for a long, long time. Uh, they like to have people believe that mental health problems are frequently uh, you know, brain disorders and that if they can just find, you know, exactly what it is that uh, is there, maybe they can do something to correct it. Uh, you know, they used to, at a certain point in time, you know, they would cut out part of your brain. You know, they would do a lobotomy <laughs> type of thing. They still today, and I think in a few places, do brain surgeries for issues. I, I think, you know, again, there, there are a very small group of people who honestly have organic brain problems. And, and without medication, these individuals are going to have a hard time functioning, period. Uh, and, and so medication is justified there. Uh, I don't believe uh, psychosurgery is ever justified. <laughs> Uh, it's not something that usually works very well. And, uh, you know, our emotions are meant to be felt. The, the good emotion and, and emotions and the, and the negative emotions. So again, I would just say about imaging, uh, uh, it, it has proven not to be reliable and, and sometimes maybe not even valid. You know, they use one, one uh, uh, you know, with schizophrenia which is a, a uh, condition which a good deal of the time is pretty organic and, and medication could be justified uh, in, in some of those situations. But you know what, one of the things that they uh, often uh, uh, confound or confuse is that once you are diagnosed, let's say with a psychotic disorder, they want to give you antipsychotic medications. And, and they can do that for hoarders too, and, and a lot of different things. But once you start taking antipsychotic medication, which can be very toxic, and you take it for a long period of time, that in and of itself could alter what your brain looks like. And, and they've done autopsies that have shown that's actually the case. Uh, so again, I, I wouldn't put too much into imaging. You know, the imaging is good if you have, you know, a cancer or something of that nature. 
but generally for mental health problems, no. Now, some people who are hoarders, <clears throat> in a sense, may actually be uh, in dementia and the imaging could show that you know, you're in a dementia, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, other, uh, uh, other people may have uh, you know, a brain tumor or something and, and uh, that is contributing to, to the hoarding. But for most people, hoarding is something which is pretty in, in, the, in the ballpark of what I've been trying to present to you uh, tonight. And one sort of related follow-up, do you think it's hereditary? Well, uh, uh, I, again, I, I would say no, in general, you, you know, that it, it, it would be something hereditary. But, but of course, you know, there could be personality, temperament, tendencies. There could be role modeling, you know, maybe a parent was kind of a hoarder, maybe not one that got to... Uh, you know, dis total dysfunction, and and a child growing up in that kind of you know environment might take that on, and and again there there could be certain tendencies uh, that that could be there. I mean, heredity is real. You know, yes, that could be. Okay, all right. Uh, are you are you done, Bob? Real quick. All right, Charlie, you're next. Uh, I'll lower your hand and we'll go with you next, Charlie. Okay, Dan. I have a loony neighbor who has a stockpile of weapons. <laughs> and he demonstrates a great deal of excitement when he returns from a gun show in Indiana. And he shows me his latest acquisition. Um, I mean, at what point is this a transition from being a collector to a hoarder take well, place. I mean, and uh, Tim, please, on my turn, if you don't mind, sir. <laughs> and has this seems to reduce his anxiety, his anxiety, but augmented the anxiety of the neighbors. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, you know, I, I, uh, would, I mean, again, you know, now, uh, Hoarding uh, firearms uh, generally it wouldn't be considered to be a hoarding problem, you know, in in a, in a sense because uh, you know you're not going to have a situation where the firearms are probably going to get a, in the way of what's going on in the place. I mean, that's a problem that you're dealing with where uh, the neighbor uh, is you know, probably purchasing a lot of these firearms off of interest, excitement, emotion. He's very enthusiastic about firearms and, and you know, shooting. And uh, yeah, you know, but uh, uh, we wouldn't call that a hoard because maybe he has, I don't know, 20, 30 firearms in, in his place. Clearly, if those firearms are endangering you or other neighbors, that just becomes a problem uh, in and of itself. Different though. Do you think I should recommend to him that he seek treatment? <laughs> well, he, he might shoot you. <laughs> no, I, I think that, uh, you know, again, it, something like that, you know, same way as, you know, some of these really wealthy people, they, they collect automobiles. You know, you don't, you don't need all those automobiles, just like he probably doesn't need most of those firearms. But, you know, people, their, their interest, excitement, you know, tells them uh, to do it. And for whatever reason, you know, again, people collect different things. But collecting things can't be viewed as a clinical hoarding problem. Okay, uh, if not, if so, then we'll move on to uh, all I'm just going to say, Father, yeah. So please, uh, I don't know if that's the right name. Give me, give, me, give me the right way to address you, sir. Okay, it's fraud job, but it's okay. No worries. Hi, hi. You know, I, I have a, you know, obviously you can't uh, give diagnosis here. And uh, thank you so much for your talk. It's very interesting. Um, but 
I, I'm kind of an atypical situation where I'm really a hoarder big time, but I don't have any of these other issues. At least I don't know of them. I don't seem dysfunctional and I, and I have a, a career and a business and I'm, you know, but I do have, you know, a house that's really basically unlivable. And so it pretty, it's pretty serious in that way. Um, but yet it doesn't, you know, I have a life. And so obviously that's not the typical situation because I see what you're talking about in the typical situation and it does fall within these parameters. But yet, you know, I do have kind of the same problems and I, you know, I have trouble living in my house because I don't have a functional kitchen or this or that. <laughs> So, yeah. so it's kind of weird, you know, but then, uh, you know, it also causes me, I travel eight months out of the year and I have houses, different houses, of course, they're all filled with stuff, but, you know, I've, so it's kind of a weird situation in that way. I don't know what the solution is. I'm kind of lost and I've tried to different things. And obviously you can't help in that, you know, directly, but I don't know if you've seen kind of situations like this um, and have any suggestions. Yeah, well, here, you know, so take, uh, again, uh, if, if you are living in a home that really isn't functional, then just, you know, by definition, that would be a hoarding problem. But what you're saying is, yeah, you know, I have that. It is the case, but I'm on the road a lot. I'm not there a good piece of the time. Um, and, uh, you know, it doesn't bother me that much. So, uh, you know, to, to uh, answer the question of whether that is a hoarding problem, well, it is a problem just by definition, the home you're describing that you live in, your primary home. But as far as that being a problem for you, uh, that isn't necessarily the case, you know, uh, because maybe your needs are being taken care of. Sounds like you probably have financial stability. You may have an adequate emotional support system, community involvement, etc. You know, and, and that, uh, you know, it, it reminds me of uh, the problem with these storage units <laughs> uh, where somebody could, if they had the money, available, they could have five storage units full of stuff, and they could just pay out to the company that money. And they could have in their own home, a, you know, pretty functional place. Is that a problem? Well, it's not a problem for public storage or the company. They love it. And, and uh, uh, they and, and by the way, the, these companies they understand the attachment that people have to their stuff and they exploit that. <laughs> you know, they know pretty much that as long as someone can afford it, the chances are pretty good that it's going to stay there. And then it'll finally end when they can't pay for it anymore, that kind of thing. Uh, so, you know, people could do that. You, you could have a second home, you know, as you're saying. And, and it's just completely, <laughs> and it's full of stuff, <laughs> Yeah, actually three, but yeah. And yeah. And I have friends that have storing, you know, hoarding and storage units and yeah, I don't have storage, but yeah. Yeah. Well, if, if, if I may ask a question real quick, uh, to our friend, Mr. Yeah. Um, would you be able to like afford a, uh, people to help you clean up or whatever? If you need I've tried it. I've tried. I've tried that. I've tried different groups. I've tried a lot of things, and <laughs> nothing's nothing's really helped, unfortunately. Well, yeah. there may there may be there may be some kind of you know, a, a, I and I'm just gonna put this thing. I myself had some trouble recently with just taking care of a lot of emotional stuff, and myself, I got a small dose of psychiatric medication not too long ago from the through the VA. And it really helped me out a lot to start coping with some of the stuff I'm dealing with. I'm not saying it's for everybody, but I found that uh, just a very small dose under counseling really helped out. So, you know, I'd be more, and I, I'm saying, I, I won't, I won't say more than that because I know we got more questioners. Uh, thank you very much for sharing, by the way, Father, if I, if I, if I, me, I'll, if I'll call you Father Yah, 
Um, thank you very much for sharing. Okay. Uh, Ellen Corley, you're next. So please ask your question. Okay. Um, yeah. Hi. Uh, I, if you look in the background of my, my hoard here, um, <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I, you know, people probably had thought that I'm a hoarder, uh, you know, and it, it got worse um, with, yeah, I'm a market researcher and I uh, was, you know, starting 2008, I wasn't working really 2002 um, for companies where, you know, you've got to focus and you keep, you're doing, turning in your paper. And but I was never any good at uh, really, you know, filing everything away, throwing everything away. I'm, I'm more search rather than organize. Um, but without the, the uh, kind of, external locus of control, like, you know, the client to give the report to, nothing really finishes. And um, I, I think another aspect of it is that, um, that like, you, you know, that I'm working alone. So I think I fit the criteria in those regards. And, uh, but I, it's, it's interesting, um, I guess now, what is the question is, uh, one is, I guess you're a psychiatrist, right? I guess. Um, no, no, no. no. I've, I'm a, I've, I've worked as, I, I would identify myself as a community psychotherapist. Oh, okay. I've never heard of that before. That's, you make money doing that? Um, well, I'm, I'm retired now, so. You I'm, used you know, to? Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I worked, I worked uh, in community uh, mental health for 23 years. I retired from the Chicago Department of Public Health the end of 2016. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So here's here's another here's a question. Kind of is it's interesting to me. A, a problematic area is um, that I've you know this well like one you know people say oh you know help Ellen clean up it's a fire hazard which it's not <laughs> we did have a neighbor who was one but I um, but it you know this idea recently it was odd that. Um, well, this neighbor moved in and he's a very, um, he, he's acted like he is the property manager, but, and, you know, he's done some things to the building, but he, he was going to find me every week because the carpet had a urine smell inside my apartment from my cat. And so I moved it back, but this, this invasive idea, I was like, how, what? And then they had lawyers send this to the property management company. I was like, what if I like the smell of urine? But I, you know, I, I cleaned it up, but it just, it, it was horrible to me that they, and I said, what is the bylaw that gave him the sense of this? And he goes, oh, well, like having loud parties. And, um, you know, and it, it was like, what? You know, um, it, so this idea of, of the public health being sent in is, is kind of a trigger. And then just more recently, I got a call from Salvation Army, which I have, a, I got a cert, advanced certified alcohol um, counseling degree, you know, 10 courses at Harold Washington, Kennedy King. And they, um, I, I did, I created an internship at Salvation Army. And I think somehow they got that list and the Salvation Army called me and said, we're calling with a wellness check on you. I was like, who did that? I think somebody's harassing me, like Cheryl. And I, I you know, no, I, I do not need a wellness check. But then, then this woman just comes over, you know, somehow gets past the door and goes, I'm Salvation Army doing a wellness check on you. You know, I was like, who filed this? Uh, it's anonymous. You know, um, it, it really was invasive. And, and that's where, what, and I think that's partly what I, why I do so much research now is this idea that this technocracy, this behavioral health, um, you know, I, I, I'm more the talking type, but the idea that the government you know, is now we're just talking to machines and, and databases um, is, is scary. And so here's the last connection. I don't know if you've seen the movie, The Recorder is a great movie of a woman who is just recorded everything on TV for 50 years. Her husband divorced her, her kid thought she was crazy. But when she died, they sent all these recordings. She was, she was showing the lies in the media, you know, with Nixon and all these things. And the, the National Archives made it into a, very, a great documentary. They took everything she had and, and showed, look, she's capturing history because she sees all the contradictions and, and 
you know, dirty politic, political tricks that I think on one level, that's why, you know, I'm trying to stop the abortion, you know, takeover. I'm trying to stop the vaccine misinformation and censorship. And if you can't really address social problems, they question? just keep building up. So that's that's my question comment. Okay. Um, any, uh, Dan, you want to rebut that real quick? <laughs> well, um, you, you know, Ellen, I mean, you know, some of these <laughs> things that you, you that you've experienced are, uh, you know, they, they're, they uh, uh, are kind of embarrassing, right? Be, you know, having somebody show up and they're doing a wellness check on you and, and you have a sense of yourself as being a very autonomous, independent person. And, and yeah, I, I understand, you know, how, how you're uh, reacting to that. But, if, you, you know, the, the problem uh, with the hordes or, or the, the minor hordes, again, you know, a lot of people uh, are, are going to have reactions. And, you know, we live in a kind of culture where, uh, you know, people don't like to sometimes directly confront or, you know, address something to somebody because it could be dangerous even. Uh, and, and so, you know, people are in the habit of calling up 311 or 911 or you know reporting somebody to to an agency and uh uh it it's just uh, you know it kind of goes with uh the territory and and uh you know again as, as far as a horde goes if your place is functional and there isn't a fire hazard that kind of thing uh you know, that it should not be a problem uh, for you or, or somebody else. It should, it's okay. felt like harassment. Do you think it's people should be able to harass people? Well, like, like Charlie could have somebody, you know, show up at that hey, guy's. That house sounds ridiculous to me. That's harassment. All right. All right. Let's, uh, let's, uh, let's see, I harassment. Think oh, come huh? somebody. Huh? Never mind. Never mind. We got. We got somebody. That's, is that Doug? I mean, I don't think this is, I, I don't think anybody, I don't think it was done by anybody I know. I think it was done by an outside group. Okay. Um, well, know, all right. People Ellen, who, who know me and love me would try to help me. But look, I've got a beautiful place. Sometimes I'm trying to keep a standard up that my mother wanted. And, oh. and so there is a shame factor, you know, um, right. That's trying to be perfect, look perfect, like a material girl. Okay. All right, Ellen, mm -hmm. we're going to have to move on now. Okay. All right. Okay. All right, Karina Schuschenheim, you got the next question. Um, hoarding and. The, okay, just real quick, Jake, is that you at eight four seven on the phone? Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, Jake, but we're gonna we're not to you yet. I just wanted to make sure it was you. All right, Karina, please go ahead. All right, just to review real quick, Karina, Margaret, Jean, and then Jake. Or Jean's uh, gone, so Charlie. Uh. So anyway, go ahead, please. All right. Oh, no, I'm, I'm present. I'm present. Okay, Gene. Um, did you still want to ask a question? Oh, no, no. I, okay, I, then I took you off the list. Okay, right, my so apologies. Now it's uh, Karina, Margaret, Mute, Charlie, please. and Jake. Okay, Karina, I'm sorry about that. I just wanted to get the uh, order down. Please go ahead. I have two questions. One question is how prevalent is hoarding in Cook County? How many cases are there a year um, that involve intervention? And my second question is, is there something specifically different about animal hoarding versus hoarding uh, inanimate items? Okay, so the first, yeah, the, the first question, I, I can't give you a uh, uh, real answer to that. I do suspect that there are numerous problems. Uh, uh, you know, uh, hoarding is, is perceived to be a common problem, but I do not know, you know, what the prevalence or incidence of hoarding, uh, you, you know, which would be something that had been reported probably to some uh, agency or agencies. Uh, and what was your second question? Is there a different animal. profile 
for someone who hoards animals versus yep. someone who hoards inanimate objects. The person okay. with the 150 cats or yeah. 300 yeah. dogs versus yeah. well, I have my room full of newspapers. Okay, so uh, with with animal hoarding, you know, whether it's cats, dogs, whatever. Shut up. Um, the, uh, who is that? The, 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 I'm sorry, please. My apologies, please. I think we may have a troll on, but I'll find out. Okay, go ahead. All right. So as far as animal hoarding goes, um, clearly it's the, the motivations are the same, you know, as, as any other kind of hoard, you know, from the standpoint of the emotions involved and perhaps the need deficiencies that exist, it's the same. However, with animals, um, like cats, for example, you know, there, there's, if, or dogs, they, there's going to be an attachment to the live animal, which is, you know, will generally be very, very strong. And that can make it somewhat more difficult. And of course, you know, there's people who uh, are sort of, you know, they, they see themselves and, and uh, uh, as, uh, you know, animal rescue people. You know, there's all these cats that are out there. Uh, they're not going to maybe meet a very good end, but, you know, I'm going to feed them, try to take care of them and so on. And, and what happens is, again, everybody is capable of becoming habituated, desensitized to the horde or having all of the animals around. They're used to it and they don't necessarily see it as a problem. That can be very, very hard for the person to let it go, right? Because they really have strong, strong attachments to the animals, at least a lot of the time. Okay, um, Karina, did, 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 did that answer your question? Yes. Karina. Okay, yes. good. I'm gonna move on now to Margaret. So Margaret, please, uh, Margaret Gillette, you're on the air. Okay, I have a quick question. Um, I was married to a person whom I consider to be a hoarder. Now, because I was constantly probably enabling it because I didn't allow it to get out of hand. It wasn't interfering in our social life normally. Certainly he could hold a job. Um, it, it never became paramount the way that I saw it in two other people. And I'm just wondering um, if... Uh, the true, the person who is a hoarder where it's most easily seen is where it interferes with that person's ability to have relationships, job, maintain health. And I'm thinking of two different people. One of them really was poor. And she, you could just barely crawl in the apartment to access her needs because she had collected anything and everything she could uh, that she might be able to sell to raise money. It was understandable, but you know, it was very dysfunctional. The other one was very embarrassed, took her home one time and she apologized. She said, I wish I could ask you to come in, but she said, there's only a little narrow path in my home. And she admitted that she was a hoarder. So my question is, it would seem to me like uh, the, the, the true hoarder is not able to function in various spheres, either health-wise, socially, job-wise, whereas the person, the pack rat just disorganized, but he or she can go about their normal routine. So I'm just wanting to know a little bit more, what actually defines the hoarder? Well, okay, so um, again, the hoarder is going to, I, I mean, they, they are going to have uh, emotion Mm -hmm. management issues mm -hmm. and and what i kind of highlighted tonight was just two emotions which are most key for a hoarder that's interest excitement emotion and anxiety yes and and so the the uh uh the hoarder is is going to especially since it's usually the case they have these need deficiencies 
They don't, they're financially unstable in a lot of cases. They basically do not have an adequate emotional support system of people who they're you know, attached to and linked to. Uh, they don't really have much of a community involvement. So these are things which, you know, the hoarder needs to address and, and to get cleared up, or it's, it becomes very difficult to, to stop the hoarding. Now, again, and so what could happen to somebody is uh, the neighbors or the family just simply turn them in. You know, they just turn them into various agencies and, and they are told they've got to get the hoard taken care of. The hoard gets cleaned out, you know, like you see on the, on, the, on the hoarder reality show. You know, it gets cleaned out. It's a major undertaking. But here's the problem. If that person has not taken care of their need deficiencies and their emotion management problems, they're likely to start up again. You know, it's like a drug addict. If, if a drug addict, you know, gets clean and sober or whatever at a certain point in time, but they no longer have adequate emotional support or community involvement, uh, they're likely to take up uh, uh, drinking or using drugs again. They'll relapse. And it's the same thing with hoarding. Actually, hoarding in terms of a mechanism has a lot of similarities to uh addiction problems. Oh, I think it is something of an addiction. I'll tell you something really funny for everyone's, um, uh, the fact that it was just so funny. I cleaned out a storage unit. He was with me. He was beginning to have dementia, but we took it to Goodwill Industries to one of those trucks. And I, the man came out and bought all the stuff. And when my husband discovered it, he went running to the truck and tried to get in there to retrieve the stuff. <laughs> and Goodwill said, I'm sorry, sir, but you cannot come in here. This belongs to us now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's... And they're just, you know, it's crazy. You have to life at some of it. Yeah, you know, it's, it's like the, uh, uh, you, you know, scene that they like to talk about, you know, somebody who's, say, a crack cocaine addict you know, on the floor scurrying around to see if they could just find one more little dose. And, and uh, you know, it, it's- I disagree. Oh. Um, <laughs> it's all right. Well, Alex, we, we, may, we may disagree with it. All right, uh, Margaret, are you, are you done with your questions at this point? Definitely. <laughs> okay, um, I'm gonna let Charlie, I know you've had a question already, so I'm gonna go let Jake go next and then we'll get to you, okay? All right, Jake. Didn't Ernie, uh, have, didn't, didn't Ernie have a question? Um, Marie? No, Ernie. Ernie. Well, Ernie went once already, but I think uh, we got him oh, okay. once already. My question is sometime toward the beginning. You, uh, you said under certain circumstances, a, a child could be taken away from them because of a hoarding problem. Yeah, sure. Sure, because How so? okay, well, if if it's a situation where uh, the authorities, uh, you know, uh, child welfare services, you know, around here, you know, DCFS, you know, they, if if they decide that the environment is unsafe for the child, that it's the child is actually in danger in that environment, and the person refuses to do anything about it, uh, they could lose, you know, it's not going to be that easy, but in the end, they could lose custody of the child. Well, who, 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 are, who are the authorities? The, the authorities are, are the child welfare, uh, you know, system, you know, DCFS, for example, here in, in but, uh, Chicago. But under, under, under what circumstances would they Well, would well they okay, well, the circumstances, okay, so the circumstances, let's say that the horde has gotten to a point where uh, there's, it's difficult to access the kitchen or the bathroom. There's all sorts of stuff that could topple over onto the child, you know, boxes stacked up, you know, not that stable. Uh, yeah, you know, if, if the child is perceived to be in danger and it doesn't get corrected, now, you know, that, that individual, uh, may have other problems. You know, they may have addiction problems. 
along with the hoarding problem, you know, uh, and and such, and and may not really be able to take care of the child. But strictly in terms of the hoarding, if the child, if the authorities feel that the child is in danger, they can uh, uh, take away custody. You, you know, give it to a relative, usually. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But why? Why, how is it, how are they being let's move on what Say again let's move on, okay. Jay. okay one one other one other one other one other question you you mentioned at the beginning that uh that uh, batman had a hoarding problem does um uh, does uh, uh <clears throat> does rock do, do rocky and bowl have a hoarding problem <laughs> i can't answer that question <laughs> but uh you know, I'd like to think that uh, Batman really doesn't have that hoarding problem. <laughs> he should be in there. He can get the place cleaned up if he wants to. You know, his yeah. war, he just has his company going and clean for him. Yeah. All right. Are you done, Jake, with your questions at this point? Yeah. Good. Okay, Good. Charlie, uh, you're next up. And uh, let's just hope it's not the nonsensical situation you had before because you haven't left your house in two years. I, I don't know if that's any of concern to you. Oh, I know, but I'm just saying when you're going to talk Tim, about is that, that of any concern to you what I do? Well, it's as if when you're telling about your fictitious... Tim, is that of any yes. concern to you? Can I give you a hard time once in a while? No, I, I don't think it's your purpose. Okay, anyway, anyway, let's, let's go on. You don't inject yourself into the program, if you don't mind. <laughs> All right, Dan, go ahead. Go ahead, Charlie. You got your question now, Charlie. Go ahead. I don't think that's amusing. I don't see what. Go ahead is. and ask your question, okay? I was giving you a hard time. No, I don't think that's appropriate. Well, I'm sorry it wasn't appropriate. All right, let's go. Have you done it before or other speakers? Now stop it. Okay, now, Dan, I call it the, I see advertisements yeah. for um, people to, uh, collect what I call shiny objects, specifically investing in gold, gold coins, or silver dollars, extending over a period of years of subscribing to this. Have you encountered any situations or would you classify it as hoarding wealth? Well, uh, okay. now this is one that doesn't involve yeah. large, large items, large collection of articles to fill well, up an apartment, but I still think that would classify as hoarding, wouldn't it? Well, yeah, you know, so here, here's how I, I would kind of um, answer that. It, it, it's, so as, as I said, uh, you, you know, I, you, at times I, I would put in a uh, photograph of Donald Trump <laughs> and and as as you you know an icon for money hoarding and and you know it's the same kind of things that drive it you know the interest excitement uh, the in some time if you know i i would say uh, and of course with a lot of individuals uh, who if, you know because you ask the question why why would somebody i don't know who has hundreds of millions of dollars want more. Why would you ever need more? And of course- Like Carnegie. Yeah, well, all of them. Why would you ever need more? But the problem is, well, first of all, this is a little bit of a tangent, but a number of these individuals tend to be psychopathic. And when somebody is psychopathic, it, implies that they see the world uh, through a predator prey lens. You know, that's all that we have, there's predators and, and there's prey. And, and the people like, you know, Trump and a lot of these others, they see themselves as predators. And, and they, they basically are in competition to get more power <clears throat> and be the biggest predator that they can be. And this can drive them, you know, it's like it becomes almost like a challenge or a goal. It's an interest, uh, excitement driven kind of thing. 
they generally don't have much anxiety, you know, about not having any money, but they basically are, are very much into the hoarding of uh, wealth and money because it translates into power. And if you want to be a powerful predator, money is really helpful. <laughs> you know, that, that, and, and that's what motivates uh, a lot of people. And, and it's unfortunate, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in this culture, in this society, uh, it's very, very easy for psychopathic individuals to really rise up and get into you know, positions of power if they have the appropriate education and, and a set of social skills you know, for interpersonal types of things. And, and, uh, you know, uh, and, and the final thing I would just mention about psychopathy uh, in, in this regard is that you know, the, the psychopath, the predator, basically views the prey the people that they exploit or take advantage of as deserving that. You know, they have contempt for the victims, the people who they take advantage of or hurt. Uh, you know, it's almost like, well, you know, you're weak, I'm strong. Probably if you were strong and I was weak, you'd be doing the same thing to me that I'm doing to you. And, and we don't really have much of a check on that very much. And, in this kind of a culture anymore, uh, but uh, it good, you know, as far as gold or or the accumulation of wealth, yeah, you know, people now, you know, if you're somebody who like right now, let's say, there's this inflation problem that we have right now in our country, you know, and and people are, you know, maybe thinking this is a good time to accumulate, I don't know, gold or silver. Uh, and, and just to have it because maybe my money or my assets are, are not my, you know, paper assets aren't going to be good anymore. I mean, you know, we're, we're programmed, you know, to uh, collect items that we need for survival. The only question is, when does that collecting of things, you know, cross over into clutter and, and hoarding problems? Uh, and and but yeah it, okay okay um or we have two more questioners i know vicky you went before but i'd like to give jan a chance to go first if you don't mind so jan i'm going to let you uh overcome vicky real quick lower your hand and uh go ahead and ask your question um i got intrigued by this idea of um psychopathic people collecting money um and uh, the, the thing I've been telling people is, you know, if you have a bank account with some money in it and someone who, um, you know, uh, looks at that money and is able to look at that money and what they say to themselves is that money is really mine because I can get it away from you because you're kind of stupid and I'm kind of smart. And so if I can get that money into my own bank account, it really belongs to me. And uh, I, I just wonder what you think about that theory. This is the way I've been interpreting this. Yeah, well, uh, again, you know, the uh, uh, psychopathy is an extremely dangerous problem in a culture. Now, you know, if you go back to, you know, much smaller groups, you know, like kind of tribal hunting gathering type groups, somebody who uh, is a psychopath, for whatever reason, they're not going to remain in that group. The group will not, that'll be identified very quickly. And the person will not be allowed to go on. It's, it's, and, and so, in that kind of a setting, you don't have that. And that includes in those settings, you know, so let's say somebody is a leader of, of a small group and they, and they tend to be psychopathic themselves. Again, in those kind of environments, it'll only be a matter of time before that person will probably be taken down. 
because the group survival depends on having reciprocity and, and uh, uh, cooperation. Psychopathy is no good for reciprocity and cooperation. And, and in, uh, uh, you know, when, when again, when you look at these people, they, uh, you know, people like Trump, and uh, there's just so many we have uh, uh, in, in our society these days. A lot of the politicians are straight up psychopaths. And, and again, they, they compete with each other to try, you know, everybody wants to be the number one predator you know, the big alpha predator, you know, kind of a thing. Uh, even these billionaires can compete with one another. Uh, and and it's, it's no good, for, in my opinion, you know, it's just totally uh, destructive of uh, any large group like a country or, you know, the, the kind of situation that, that we're in. And, and of course, again, the psychopath always has contempt for the victims. It's, you know, they just see it as, you know, I got over on you, you're a loser, and I'm the winner. And, you know, by the way, I'm sure if you were in my position, you'd be doing the same to me. So why should I have any sympathy, empathy, mercy on you? That's a, that's a dangerous kind of mindset for people to have, and a lot of them have it. And, and the politicians, you know, who, I, I mean, they, they, you know, if you want to get a lot of power and sometimes a lot of money, because you may, you know, a lot of politicians don't come from inherited wealth, that kind of thing. And so they're interested in uh, what can I do to get the money, which translates to the power that I crave. And, and, you know, political power is meaningful in and of itself. And so what they tend to do is if they're psychopathic, they just simply lie to the people. They see the people as being almost contemptible, but they give the people the messages that they think will get them the victory. And then once they get in to office, they'll go ahead and take care of themselves uh, in, in ways that they feel advances their own interests. And, and uh, again, unfortunately, uh, you know, we've in this, in this country uh, and other places, obviously, uh, the psychopaths get a stranglehold on, on uh, uh, everything. Um, you know, let me just make one more comment. I, um, I have been uh, very uh, marginally, and even that's an exaggeration, involved with governors of Michigan. Um, Jennifer Granholm, I've known about her for a long time, and... Um, Gretchen Whitmer, and um, at least Jennifer Granholm, but uh, it's because of a prisoner who was innocent and has been in jail since he was 15, and now he's like 46 or seven, something like that, and I know that he's innocent, um, but I look at Jennifer Granholm as a person who, when she has any, any kind of a, per, of a choice to make, she's always going to make the ch choice that she feels will advance her career. Yeah. And it's not, it has absolutely nothing to do with responsibility to other people or whatever. It's just what will advance my career. And uh, I know this is off the subject and I'm through talking, thank you. Well, Janet, uh, it might be a, a hoarding of power if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> All right, Vicki, you got the last question, and then we'll go to rebuttals unless anybody else pops their hand up. Okay, Vicki, go ahead. Brief anecdote followed by question. I was staying at a friend's house over the weekend, not the friend, but the parents, and they were out of town, and they just wanted us to look, water the plants and feed the pets. Well, I bought a, a very small carry-on bag for a couple de days, and uh, just fully unconsciously, I looked around when I'd been there half an hour and my coat was on one chair. I had a book on the table. I had a handout on another chair, scarf and gloves on another chair. And, and I felt 
ashamed and horrified. I thought, look how I'm spreading out here. And then I thought, am I marking territory like a cat would? I mean, I did urinate over everything, fortunately, but I, I just wonder if there isn't some instinctual thing because it felt so unconscious and it's as if I abhor an empty surface. I, yeah. I, I don't yeah. like empty surfaces. Yeah, well, well, just, uh, you, you know, again, uh, uh, hoarding itself uh, and marking of territory and, it, it, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things that are very, very hardwired instinctive. You know, and, and I mean, you know, just, I mean, we're talking human nature, human nature, you know, we, I mean, we have laws, we have ethical systems, we have religions, you know, etc. various kinds of uh, institutions that are meant to regulate uh, human nature, you know, because human nature just unleashed isn't very pretty a lot of the time so uh, yeah but a lot but a lot of things are they're they're just you know kind of instinctive and uh but but you know most people uh do have hardwired into them a, a need for fairness and respect we all have that in us we want to be treated fairly not exploited not you know injured uh, and and uh, we want to be respected we want to be treated as a human being and, and we, we need respect. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, again, instincts, uh, you know, the need to, uh, you know, again, be uh, in, a, in a predatory frame uh, it can really lead to problems. And, and good leaders, you know, if, you know, for example, military leaders or any, any kind of leader um, it needs to, you know, or politician needs to be very, very conscious of uh, the use of power and, and to not, you know, get into a uh, exploitation uh, kind of a mode. Okay, is that, uh, Vicki, I just posted in the chat, I was just on my other computer and I just posted a a chat about the very subject you were looking for mark people marking territory oh okay and it's it's it's, it's uh, interesting has to do with hoarding but they also correlate it with property rights and uh markings of fences and other things like that you know um anyway i won't go much into it all right uh jan you wanted to before we go to uh rebuttals jan you wanted to make an announcement correct jan bodart are you there if you want yes, to make an announcement. yes, I want to make an announcement. Go ahead, Jen. Okay. Um, uh, as usual, this announcement is about the night, the Nuclear Energy Information Services Night with the Experts. This mm -hmm. will be the 30th of June at 7 p.m. Central Time. Uh, the person speaking will be Michael Schneider, um, and his subject is going to be nuclear power in the world closing the gap between perception and reality. Um, if you don't get a, a formal invitation uh, and you want to come, you can get hold of me. My uh, email is janbudar1 at gmail.com. And um, just a word about Michael Schneider. He is the originator of the World Nuclear Industry Status Report. And um, uh, he's called the co coordinator and publisher, but I think he also founded this. And um, he also, um, well, let me just go to the bottom. Uh, he has given lectures or had teaching appointments at more than 20 universities and engineering schools in over a dozen countries. Michael has provided information and consulting services to a large variety of clients around the globe. So uh, this is the 30th of June and um, it will be at 7 p.m. And if you're having any trouble finding it, 
please send me an email at janbudar1 at gmail.com. Uh, and I'll make sure that you get on the invitation list. Okay, Jan, put uh, your email address in the chat if you don't mind. Okay, but I also want to say that if you try to get hold of me during the program, I'm extremely busy during the program and I won't be able to respond. Are we, are we is that just going to be on Zoom or will it also be like a hybrid at your uh, headquarters? No, it's just on Zoom. Okay, because I know the NEIS does a lot of good work in uh, nuclear power, though I, I myself strongly disagree with a lot of their perceptions. I'm not going to uh, you know, I'm not going to say anything else. All right, Jan, thank you for the announcement. Now, uh, Jan, thanks for bringing that to our attention. I, if I didn't have a Toastmasters meeting that way, I'd probably. Ellen have has a question. Who does Ellen? Okay. Ellen, you got another question. Um, I forget what I was going to ask now. Um, so I'll just go to comments later. Yeah, I can. All right. I'll, I'll take your hand down. <laughs> tell you what Ellen I'll put you first down for rebuttals okay okay and then who else has a rebuttal I know Charlie has one usually who else um Daniel stick around you get the last word Margaret okay okay so I have Ellen Charlie Margaret and then myself of course um who else uh, Bob wait a minute Ellen Charlie Margaret Bob Matter, okay. Uh, anybody else, Karina? You want to do one or not? Steve? No, thanks. Uh, what? You'll pass? Okay. No, thanks. Yep, I'll pass. All right, all right. Um, all right, and Jake. So I guess we got it. I'll go. Uh, we'll go Margaret. And then we'll do uh, Bob Matter. Don't put me first. I'll tell. I'll tell you. All right. How about Ellen, Charlie, Margaret, myself, Bob, Matter, and then Jake. Unless Jake wants to go first. I'll go first. Uh, okay, like Ellen. Go first. We'll just uh -huh. we'll just leave it at that. We'll just leave it in that order then. Okay. Ellen, I go last. All right, Charlie. I'll put you at last. Okay, so Ellen, Margaret, myself, Bob Matter, Jake, and then Charlie. How does that sound? Okay, Ellen, I'll lower your hand, and uh, um, I guess I'll give everybody four, four, four to five minutes. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to stop watching on my other computer. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dan. Um, I enjoy your comments and uh, enjoy this uh you know, I appreciate your professional presentation. To tell you the truth, I, you know, I thought, what does this have to do with free speech um, initially? But because uh, I, I joined this group uh, actually on the recommendation of, of Doug Binkley and um, me, who I met at United for Democracy now. And um, I can't remember the other guy's name, but it, you know, that it's a free speech forum. And I think that's what we need. My, uh, my thing is we need, we should always be speaking about the most critical issues of the day. And uh, it's like a free speech, you know, propaganda high school class or whatever. Um, sociology is what we need. And what is most pressing is, um, you know, they're taking away our rights, you know, abortion rights, the right to choose whether we want a, um, vaccine or not and um you know there's all of this i really is totalitarian corporate totalitarianism um and what i chris hedges has had a great talk i recommend on youtube a corporate totalitarianism i went to college uh, i took a logic class of philosophy with chris hedges at colgate and um and i i've really come to appreciate the wisdom of philosophers um, on, on what is knowledge, you know, ep, ep, uh, um, I forget, what, what is it? Uh, my first philosophy class is what is knowledge and what is reality? And um, the, the idea of, and, you know, Jim Fetzer who gave a great talk on pandemic and, um, 
you know, the fact that it was made and um, by the military. And he tells the truth. He said, 9-11 Scholars for Truth it gave me the suggestion of that was so helpful. It's, it's, I always knew that deductive logic is difficult, but inductive, investigating is where my mind goes. And, and he said, even beyond that, it's um, aductive, which means just always looking around and seeing what's going on in the world. That's if you want to understand anything. Um, and I learned this in sociology class. So I studied to be drug and alcohol counselor. You have to take a class introduction to social work. And they do a great job of saying, you know, look at any issue, the mic, the macro, the mezzo is the institution, the macro are the laws, policies, and the micro is, you know, my particular issue that I'm, I'm concerned about. Um, you know, at the time I was concerned about like, where are the internships in my, this school program? And they, it, you know, it turns out the more I looked into it that, you know, it all starts with the macro, the laws and policies. And what we've got now is trickle down, uh, you know, the results of Reagan's, particularly 1981, uh, when he stole the election by the October surprise. And, um, you know, with William Casey and these guys, they got in there and put in executive order 12333 saying, that as long as the head of the CIA and the head of the Justice Department, both of which are appointed, turns out it was Casey, agree on it. No, they will not investigate themselves. So they end up with, we have a drug war, we have a, um, you know, a mass incarceration and, um, you know, total deception. They got rid of honest services laws, federal honest service laws, pushed it to the state in the late 90s also uh, failed to put in the Citizen Protection Act, the McDade Burton Bertha Citizen Protection Act. So basically we had this corrupt Republican party, but also it, it got Clinton and these guys, they stole the Insular Promise software and prosecuted their management information system and made it into the ultimate AI system. But, so they can, you know, um, erase me and do Facebook and make sure nobody hears what I say and then throw me off if I mentioned the the vaccine word um, uh, on Facebook. So we've got, you know, all the ingredients of a fascist government, which, um, you know, total censorship, uh, total deception, uh, you know, biological warfare and denial of it, you know, killing off of the investigative journalism, burying it so nobody can see it, and and lying from the state. I, I heard this week that uh, that that is a definition of fascism. Um, you know, it barely slipped into NPR, which has been bought by, you know, the same deep state, you know, security state forces. But they, they said, you know, they did kind of manage to get in. Well, if our government is, uh, if they're all lying to us, like COINTELPRO, and we didn't do anything, and we didn't, we don't have false flag wars, and we don't, you know, this monetarism isn't the problem. Uh, you know, we don't know what the problem is. It, it happens in nature, you know. Oh, we're the experts. They, this is, you know, the problem is the, the state, you know. I mean, nothing is going to go right as long as we're living in a fascist world that is an invisible fascist okay. totalitarian oh, world. fascist caused Jordan. Okay, uh, Charlie, let her finish. She's almost out Yeah, of yeah. I think, I think you know, so like in fascism. myself, you know, all of these books, because I can't, I, you know, I, I write, but it's like putting a, a message in a bottle. So I have okay. a thousand books, okay, Nazi billionaires, a law unto itself, you know, all these books. And that did remind me of Andy Anderson. You know, I'm like, Andy, come help me with my books. I'd miss, you know, being in person where you've got left-wing people like Andy Anderson and Tony. I had a great talk the other day with Tony. Um, what's his name? Uh, you know, uh, about COVID and about 9-11. And, you know, there are people that see what's really going Andy. on. You know, um, th these are, you know, progressive. Sorry, but we... This does cause a trauma. If you write truth and you're like, there's a fascist problem here and nobody okay. hears you. I talked to my own well, father. I, I, this wrap it up, this is important. Okay, wrap it up. My own father said, don't worry. November's coming. We'll, we'll elect Trump. Meanwhile, and everything will be okay. He, they're moving him into a crazy old people's home where they're not going to be taking care of him. 
you know, I'm like, just let me come take care of you. But this is the problem. You know, a corporation is a person and trust them. You know, uh, if you can't trust your own government, it leads right. to problems, okay? And um, so, okay. All right, Margaret, you're next, go ahead. Um, <laughs> Good. We have a flight of ideas going on here. Um, sure. Okay, um, I, I, I just wanted to make some points about, about mental health and um, I heard a guy who was the director of the NIH de department on mental health and, and he's at BYU in Utah. And this was a few years ago. And one of the things that he said is that our, our development in uh, mental health is where medicine was at the end of the 19th century. You know, we kind of got names for things, but we really don't have any kind of real treatments for stuff because we don't know. And, and kind of the more we look into it, we do see that that a lot of it is an organic process, like schizophrenia and and uh, bipolar disorder, and all of those are are you know biological, physiological processes rather than your mother smacked you with your dirty diapers or whatever it was. So um, so you know we're just not there. Um, I've seen the studies about the. Well, anyway, that's not it. Bro. But the but the thing that seems to be is that uh, that use of talk therapy with medication seems to be show the best outcome of a lot of stuff, depending on what it is. And you know, all of this when you look at human behavior, it's on a continuum. So you have all the way from the from uh, and a bell curve kind of. Uh, this is, uh, anyway, that, that is kind of on a bell curve that most people are kind of in the middle with whatever. And then there's people that are on either end and extremes. Our culture is really on the accumulative hoarding end of the whole thing, because I, I saw a book about, they took pictures, a uh, group pictures of, of people and they brought the things in their houses out and took pictures of them. And, you know, some people have like 12 things, you know, and they were from fairly poor, they were from really poor societies, but they had a lot of family connections, social connections, group connections, tribal connections, whatever. So they, you know, they weren't feeling it like we would feel if we had 12 things in our house. But when you look at what Americans have, my God, it's just stunning. And so if you're in this culture, you already are pushed over on the hoarding side of stuff because we got all our stuff. Yes, we do. So I guess um, that's kind of what I wanted to say that, you know, I, I know that I, I'm hoarding now because um, we just moved, we moved a year ago. And now I'm realizing that I've got to get rid that, that you would think that I would get rid of it before I move, but no, <laughs> I carried it with me. And so, you know, cause maybe I'll need it. Who knows what I'll need in this new place. And so, um, so, but, the, but now I'm at the point where I, I really need to get rid of some of it because the, I have some interference in being able to to function, to manage what I need to manage. Um, and so I'm, that's what I'm looking at now, getting, realizing that I have to go through stuff and put out stuff and donate stuff and donate a lot more stuff and get it out of the garage and get it out of the house. And, and uh, that'll take off a lot of stress as far as I'm concerned. That's Thanks. it. Thanks, Margaret. All right, I'm gonna go next here because I got a real hoarding to me has been a, a real personal vendetta with me. I don't like hoarding, I don't like quarters. Um, the thing is, is that I worked for a company <laughs> that was a whole culture of hoarding, you know, 
oh, we made some inventory. We got some stuff that might be worth something, you know. And little did we know that we were moving. The whole company was moving. And I was the guy who had to get the trucking company arranged and put everything away and get everything right. And uh, they, this place was a bunch of people who loved to hoard stuff because they could work on things. They could never know what you meant. You know, it was a plastic injection molding company. And uh, we loaded up one straight truck of pipes. That's about a 20 foot truck by a 12 foot by a 12 foot, you know, bed. We'd send it to the new plant. It took them almost four hours to unload it. In the meantime, we had two more truckloads of nothing but spare pipe. When my boss, TB, came up to me, he says, my father wants that pipe moved to the, what were you going to do with those two trucks? I says, I was going to send them over to the uh, plant right away. He says, no, you're not. My father's never going to notice that it's gone. Uh, send it straight to the recycling center, which is exactly <laughs> what we did. And about uh, four months later, I get a question. Hey, Tim, you remember that pipe that was on that wall in that other place over there? Whatever happened to it? I said, probably went to recycling. And then I told him what his son did. And uh, he just looked at me. He says, that SOB, he says, and I never even noticed. It was 53 semi loads worth of junk into a space about half the size. We finally wound up uh, getting rack shelving on it. And we wound up getting rid of almost five truckloads of quote unquote useful inventory that was eventually ground up into plastics because the stuff they had, oh, it's going to be worth some money was plastic piping that you could get at uh, Menards for, uh, you know, five bucks. And they says, oh, it used to be 50 bucks. Yeah, 50 years ago it was. But uh, that's the type of uh, thing I was dealing with. And on top of that, the parents also had a lot of their personal stuff in there, too. And when we started, oh, no, 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 no. What are you going to do with that? I said, well, we don't know. We're going to take it to your property, I guess. No, we can't have it there. What are you going to do with it? I says, uh, we can't afford storage either. Why don't we just take the truck and then take it to Goodwill right away? Oh, and then all of a sudden, they just let us do it. So, but I could tell in the family that, you know, I was dealing with some very, very, very sensitive issues. When we got to the extra boat that was stored upstairs that hadn't been used in 20 years, uh, which was the son, Andy, he says, uh, uh, okay, I'll get a trailer for that right away. I, I guess I got to use it. My wife didn't like boating, but, 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 but it's worth money. I says, well, let's get it out of here then. So the next day we had a trailer come in and was moved to a Marine, a Marina. He eventually sold it within two months. Um, my own self per se, I had a good friend of mine who was such a hoarder that by the time she died, her and her husband had over 16 storage areas. And, uh, and then I had another friend of mine who was homeless, but he was able to find the $500 a month to keep his storage unit up. And you talk about being a little bit crazy. Well, anyway, that's what I got to say about hoarding. And, uh, I've had to do a little bit of cleanup myself with my parents. And then even with me, you know, just keeping the books around. Fortunately, I said, okay, I haven't used this in a year. One point I had 22 computers in this place, all because I could use them for something. Oh, they'll, they'll have Linux on them, which I never got around to using. So I wound up taking them to the recycling center. And I've said, Bob, Matter, you're next. And then Jake and then Charlie. Okay. Uh well, I guess I'm I guess I'm kind of a hoarder um, collector slash hoarder. I uh, I love I love collecting books. I have quite a few books, and I, I buy a lot fewer than I used to because I just don't have the space for them anymore. I live in a very small apartment, but I do like uh, you know I do like having my books. I like having them at arm's length, and uh, you know many times it's, I've been stuck at home on a snowy or icy night. And I like having that big full library. Anything that you know picks my interest, I can just walk over there and grab a book off the shelf and sit down and start reading it, whatever topic I, I'm interested in that night. Uh, same thing with music. I have quite a large collection of uh, of jazz that I, I love listening to. Uh, only CDs, though. I did not uh, collect jazz on vinyl because, uh, again, because of space considerations. 
and now I'm, I'm too old to move into vinyl. A lot of people are getting into vinyl and, uh, you know, buying, you know, expensive hi-fi equipment and all that. I don't have that kind of stuff. But there are people that have very high-end uh, hi-fi equipment and they swear by vinyl and they've got whole rooms that are, you know, shelves on off through like three walls uh, filled with vinyl, vinyl records, floor to ceiling. And then one wall where all their hi-fi equipment is. But anyway, and I also, my other thing is, uh, is I, I, I got into camera collecting. Now, for about 40 years, I had one film camera and, uh, and you know, a couple of lenses. And uh, when I got another film camera in 2017, uh, well, that really set me off down the rabbit hole. I had such a ball playing with this old film camera. I bought a, an old 1960s Yashica rangefinder. And I had such a ball with it. After years, I had some digital cameras in there. And uh, after, uh, after the digital experience, it was so fun going back to manual old cameras where you only had, you know, three settings, uh, you know, on a light meter maybe. And uh, uh, it was just such a blast. And I started getting a couple more cameras and a couple more and a couple more pretty soon. Well, you know, you figure there's about 10 classic cameras that every collector needs to have just like there's 10 classic guns every gun collector has to have same thing with cameras so i got those and uh or most of them and uh, then you start branching out you know you uh once you have uh, 35 millimeter fill it up then you start getting into medium format and once you have single lens reflexes then you start getting into range finders or vice versa and i just have a ball collecting them i love shooting them all I love collecting all the old vintage lenses. Everyone has a little bit different character and they're just, I just have a ball with them. And uh, part of the reason I, uh, I started collecting these is uh, to keep my mind sharp as I got older. So I wouldn't get uh, Alzheimer's, you know, I, uh, you know, because I'm always learning all these cameras. They're all similar, but they're all a little bit different. And some of them I'd buy and I fix, you know, try to fix them myself. If they need a little repair, some, some I send out for repair. And uh, hopefully when I retire, I will do more of that. You know, I'll have more time to dedicate to things like repair because they're really fascinating little machines. They're sort of uh, like artwork in a way. Uh, uh, if, if you appreciate them, like fine watches, there's people that collect watches. Uh, they're called horologists. Uh, and, uh, and I know some of those people. And I, and I don't collect watches. I have a few watches, but I'm not a watch collector uh, per se. But uh, so anyway, so collecting kind of leads you into that. But I think, you know, I think it's kind of a, a fun, healthy thing to do. And there's a, it's a blast to uh, stop at a garage sale or an antique store or a thrift store and walk in there. And, you know, that thrill of the hunt and you never know what you're going to find. It's like a little treasure hunt. And sometimes you uh, find a, a really, you know, gem of a camera at very little cost and, uh, you know, that's just, that's, that's fun. Then you get got another camera to play, do some test rolls of film. Um, the other thing is they, you know, they appreciate, they've been appreciating in value now with the, with the Biden inflation, of course, or a good, good inflation hedge. I do want to correct our speaker. Uh, he's making this insinuation about people hoarding money that they're oppressing the people to, to get this money. And that's not the case at all uh, in capitalism. Uh, you know, sometimes these people or I'd say almost all the time, uh, these people are getting lots of money because they are satisfying the market and it's a voluntary exchange. They're providing a good service that people like and they're voluntarily giving up their money to, to buy it. I was just thinking about uh, a restaurant that I go to quite often is owned by uh, uh, some Vietnamese immigrants and it's not a Vietnamese restaurant. They sell all different kinds of food, but it is owned by some immigrant uh, Vietnamese. And I go there because I get uh, the food's good, the servings are large and the prices are low. The service is, is good and fast. And uh, so, you know, they're, they, and they got a good location. Uh, so they're, you know, they're making money, I'd say hand over fist. There's always, always people in there and they've been there a long time. Uh, so they're not, they're not oppressing me, you know, they're providing uh, good, fresh, plentiful food at a, at a good price uh, fast. And, 
at a good location. So that, that's why I go there. And uh, so there's no oppression. It's, they're just doing their job well. And uh, I got to mention, I never heard, uh, I never heard uh, anybody exclaim that Reagan stole his elections. He had two of the biggest uh, landslides we've ever seen. Uh, I can tell you what the, the uh, counts were. In 1984, he had he won 525 electoral votes, and in 1980 he had 489 electoral votes. So his landslide, his, his 1984 landslide was even bigger than his 1980 landslide, and of course he was going up against Jimmy Carter, who you know gave us some really high inflation. And was our probably our worst president until uh, the guy we have right now, Joe Biden, which is making Jimmy Carter look somewhat like a genius at this point. Uh, so, you know, I'm thinking there's going to be a huge red wave uh, in the midterms. And then in uh, 2024, we're going to get this country back on track. Uh, you know, ultra MAGA, either with Trump or DeSantis. I don't care who it is. Either one of them will, will be so, you know, just so much better than uh, what we have now. And uh, this thing about <laughs> accusing us of being uh, fascist and taking away abortion rights, nobody's taking away abortion rights. There is no right to an abortion. It's not mentioned in the Constitution. However, what is mentioned is the, in the Constitution is we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are create, created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are number one, life, number two, liberty, and number three, the pursuit of happiness. So it is up to us to protect life. And once, once, uh, once there's conception, uh, there is a life now at stake that is protected by the Constitution. So all this Roe v. Wade thing that's going on with the Supreme Court, this is just going to throw it back to the states. And you're going to have... Uh, you know, uh, you know, democratically run, you know, uh, you know, failed states like New York and California are gonna, you're going to keep their abortions. Uh, and then you'll have conservative states uh, that won't. And uh, you can vote with your feet. Go join, go to one of these, you know, uh, you know, uh, blue hell holes like Chicago <laughs> or L.A. or New York and ha have your, have your. Right. And by the way, no. You can't call us a fascist country because no, uh, you know, Republicans want to uh, don't want to take your guns away. Uh, the the first thing fascists do is take away guns, which is exactly what the American Marxists are doing, known as known as the Democratic Party, but okay. they're really the American Marxists. Okay, see you next week. All right, thanks. Hey a lot. Bob, Ultra Bob. Mega. Bob, why do you use an old camera if new cameras take better photos? Uh, Charlie, let's let's. Uh, you're doing exactly the same thing I did. Well, answer that. <laughs> it's crazy oh. to use an old camera. The okay, photos so, are lousy. Uh, hypocrisy. Oh no, no. So the, 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 film, the film look, uh, pink film. See, when they did cameras, the, the pixels are square, so they, they're they're too perfect. Every, the lines are too straight. Your eyes are nice to see like that. Film the molecules of the picture. Is so okay, guys, let's, let's <laughs> we still got we still got a couple of speakers yet. The molecules around. Yeah, it's yeah, it's, yeah it's, digital is too antiseptic. Okay, all right, Bob. Thanks a lot, uh, Jake. You're next. Go ahead, Jake. You got uh, five minutes. Jake, unmute. You're next. Jake, are you there? Eight four seven. Can you hear me now? Yes. Can you we hear me now? now? Yes, Jake. Okay. Um, um, I'm I'm uh, I, I'm a life I'm I'm a lifelong Democrat. I don't consider myself a Marxist. Um. Uh, is, 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 no one, no one's, no one's trying to take your guns away. The point of gun, point of gun control is just, is just to stop them from getting into the wrong hands. Um. Anyway. Uh. <clears throat> hold on a sec. Um. Oh. Yeah. Um. 
Oh, you you were talking. You made you made the example before of the um, uh, pet coke in the tenth war. I don't consider that hoarding. I consider that corporate irresponsibility is cheaper for them to just to just leave it to just dump it there and just to put it and take it away and put it into permanent storage. Same problem have same problem came up several years ago uh, in West Chicago. Um, Kermy Gay Corporation uh, owned, uh, they had, uh, there was a site of uh, where there was 36 tons of radioactive thorium tailings uh, dumped in a residential neighborhood uh, with no fencing around it. Little kids can go and play in it, very toxic material. Um, when the Superfund laws were passed in the 1980s, um, it showed up on four, four separate sites on the Superfund list. Um, uh, the uh, Attorney General at the time and probably several other both elected and unelected officials had to take uh, uh, more than 10 years going in and out of court trying to get Kerr McGee to uh, remove the thorium tailings and put them into permanent storage. And then finally they, finally they, they gave him a verbal agreement and went back on their words and the Follow, the, the the following attorney general had to follow up on it, so it was a big mess. Um, what else do I say briefly? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, I, I I guess I um. Oh, one other one other example of of, of uh, the the uh, Donald Trump was mentioned mentioned briefly before. This is just as an example. Um, uh, part of the irony with Trump is, as a businessman, he was incompetent. There was a book that came out several years ago um, called Dark Towers. I can't remember the type. I can't remember the author's name. Um, he uh, 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 Trump put up these big blitzy casinos against the advice of his own uh, financial managers. Um, sunk millions of dollars of, into them, and then three or four years later, three or four years later, he declared bankruptcy. Uh, he declared bankruptcy, uh, screw his creditors and screw his employees, and then clean up over the ta- clean up under the table. He did this about. He declared six, uh, He declared bankruptcy about six times over, and then finally Deutsche Bank, that had, which had loaned him all his money over, over the years. Uh, is suing him for like forty million dollars to uh, uh, to to uh, <clears throat> to take back money which he owes them. All right, uh, Jake. I think we may have lost you there for a minute. Um, can you hear me now? Can you yes, hear me now? Can. Yes, we can. Did you hear the end? Uh, I don't think we heard quite the end, but go ahead and repeat it real quick. Oh, still, what I said. Did you hear? Did you hear? Did you hear? Hear the stuff? Did you hear what I said about Donald Trump? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Okay. Let's uh, let's move on now. Charlie's got the last rebuttal, and then Dan, you'll get the last word. Okay. Go okay, ahead. Okay. Uh, first of all, let's thank our speaker for a very nice presentation. It was excellent. Yeah. And for bringing uh, to our attention what I would describe as perhaps a hidden problem in our society. I'll be eclectic as usual here. Uh, Throughout my career, I was employed as an archivist. I guess you would classify me as a paid professional hoarder because that's (laughs) all I did was hoard printed materials and graphic materials. So (laughs) of all manner, I... I had a normal, I had a thousand articles, uh, and I guess I'm a professional hoarder in that regard. Uh, in libraries, we reach a thing. We do something called weed a collection. Uh, if you, if I would go through the collection, and if nobody had checked the book out in a year, uh, it was a candidate for uh, deletion from the collection. Then same thing. I rule I would apply. If you haven't used something in a year, do you really, in fact, need it? Uh, I guess there are perhaps emergency situations you will convince yourself 
as Dan spoke about. Um, I made a rule, personal rule for, which I adhered to for maybe 10 years, is that I was not going to purchase any books. And I followed that rule pretty good for a few years. And then I gave it up altogether and I said, heck with this. And then began amassing enormous numbers, uh, which uh, I have today. Um, on another note, I have to differ with you. I've spoken on this at the college. I think your interpretation of hunter-gatherers is perhaps not quite accurate. Um, these were subsistence cultures. They engaged in hoarding of food whenever they could, uh, when things were in season, such as when rice was ripe, rice, R-I-C-E, they would try to harvest as much as they could and store it as best they could, but they lacked preservation methods. They would dry fish and things like that. Um, but they were subsistence cultures because they didn't engage in, of course, full-scale agriculture, which is to produce uh, food in quantity for hoarding uh, in a much better fashion or different fashion, I would say. I see no perceived reason for collecting old cameras. I've been going through a series of cameras throughout following my hobby since a teenager. And the new cameras take infinitely better pictures than any of my old cameras. And the last time I, I still remember I last film, use of film, I had 200 photos processed and maybe one of them I discarded two at most. That's what you need to do what you're doing. I, my idea was somebody even said, these look like postcards. Uh, you want to take good photos. I don't know what to, what utilitarian purpose is served by using inferior equipment, but I guess Bob seems to think it is. There's no, nothing wrong with it. Um, last of all, go ahead. It's keeping the old ways alive, really. It, it's keeping the old ways alive, just like uh, the way people go out and shoot black powder rifles, because it's fun. It's been the old ways alive. People still shoot bow and arrows. Uh, listen, listen. You know, it's, 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 anytime you buy a camera, anytime, anytime I bought a camera, I knew that the moment I walked, anytime I bought a camera, I knew the moment I walked out of the store that a new model was would be available. So I know about it, but they are significant, way better than they were from years ago. Come on. I don't know. I don't see anybody, uh, is anybody replacing Ann's ladder. You guys no. like hoarding and, time. And you still have a range of uses. They offer a greater range of uses than they ever have. Okay, All right, okay. and the last thing is, I've got to look at free market capitalism as the cause of hoarding. Uh, and do the commercial, yes. <laughs> That's exactly, Wait, have you, have you become, totally, if you become a socialist, if you become a socialist, if, if you become a socialist, you're not gonna horror or anything. All right, all right, let's let's let Charlie finish. Everybody <laughs> is is guilty of this by accumulating clothing. Look at the clothing industry, retailing, trying to convince everyone to acquire new clothing. Uh, I wear axe, shoes, who knows what, but in particular clothing that we, we have wardrobes beyond anyone's particular need. They will never, will never use all this clothing, certainly never wear it out. And yet it, it's been, and it's a nefarious activity from the start, employing it with employees producing this stuff under intolerable conditions of free market capitalism, very often using the employ of children. <laughs> what, and that's so what, what, stop. What, now what, each of us what, can what, put hey, an Jay, end to this hey, morning. Would you please okay. mute yourself? Okay, sorry. I'll mute you, Jake, don't All worry. Right, I don't mind it. All it's right, Charlie, finish up, please. We got Dan Bader. But anyhow, you can see that's the greatest uh, evidence of hoarding which is per perpetrated 
every day of the week uh, by the retailers, big box retailers. And if you want to fall prey to that, hey, that's okay with Chuck, but I'm not going to go along with their uh, exploitation of globalization. You imagine exploitation on, on a global scale. What, 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 is the, what have we created? Anyhow, thanks a lot, Dan. Let me know when you got another community uh, interest topic uh, you'd like to present. Thank you. All right, Dan, you got the last word. Uh, you can I, uh, can I respond? Can I respond to that? Uh, Jake, it's not. Uh, it's we we yeah, had let him do it. All right, Charlie. Okay. Go ahead, Jake. <laughs> Okay, can you hear me? And the, the, that to me is an absurd argument. Which, 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 what, what's, what's the alternative? You're, you're assign, you're assigning everyone a, 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 a set, a uh, set amount of clothing, and that's all the clothing you can have. You could have one, I, one. You could have standard, standard clothing for everyone in the nation. Affordable, durable, quality clothing. Uh, so everybody, so 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 yeah, everybody is assigned. So so everybody is clothing. It's very simple yeah, to like, do. Yeah, like Mao, like Mao's so, 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 so you, so you, so you, I see. So you sign everybody a uniform. That's essentially what it is. It's signing everybody a uniform. No, not at all. Right? It doesn't look like a uniform. It doesn't have to be. Well, anyway, um, I, I think, uh, not the slightest. I, you're, you're, it's you're, assuming, it's assuming, it's assuming that every, assuming that everybody uh, fits into clothing the same way. I have a hard time, I have a hard time buying they, clothing they, because I have, they have a hard sizes. That's silly. Okay. Could be right. Available different sizes. That's silly. All right, gentlemen. I, I can see now we're engaged in the in classic. Uh, a fool is not interested. You in make it in different thing. sizes. That's all. Like I said, Dan, <laughs> they're hoarding time. <laughs> it's a good time. idea. A fool Look is not interested in understanding. I see. I, I see. Besides, besides which, besides which, socialists don't socialists don't hoard clothes, right? All right, Jake. You guys Listen, must... they discovered <laughs> that in schools, uniforms are very good. It, it equalizes all the children. There's no rich or poor. It's not a fashion show. And that, that's, a different, that's, a different, that's a different. That's a That's a different issue. They do that. They do that because they don't clothing want gang signs clothing, or the block going around the school. What? Clothing is clothing. All right. Clothing is guys, clothing, man. Let's not get. Let's not get into this rabbit hole now. We got. What's that, wrong and, with all the students? <laughs> and they look. Charlie. They look much Me. All right. Let's get Dan Bader to have his uh okay. thing. I know we. I know you guys want to like rabbit holes, but uh, let's. Uh, Dan Bader, give you the last word. We'll keep the uh, Zoom call open after we adjourn to college. So, Dan, please take your last word and uh, tell us what you thought tonight and anything you want to rebut. Yeah, well, uh, again, I, I uh, uh, really appreciate uh, the free speech forum that the college is. There's not too much of that around anymore. Uh, now, I, I just want to bring up a couple of general mental health issues. Uh, what, one thing about the, the medication, uh, if you're taking antidepressant medication, you know, Prozac, Paxil, uh, Zoloft, you know, there's a bunch of them. These, these medications are minor stimulants. So when, when you take a stimulant, you know, whether it's an antidepressant, SSRI antidepressant, whether it's uh, something like Ritalin, uh, wh whether it's, you know, Adderall, amphetamine, uh, obviously cocaine, uh, when, when you take stimulating drugs, uh, it gives you interest, excitement, emotion at a certain level. So, uh, you know, so if you're depressed and you take, you know, say Prozac or Paxil or, or whatever is popular these days, uh, what happens is generally 
you're going to get some stimulation, interest, excitement, stimulation. That's going to, if it's working, it's going to override sadness, shame, and probably anxiety if, if it's working. It doesn't always work, but that, that's what's actually happening. And, and I would go back to, if, if you want to have, I, and, and when I was working, I would always tell a client, if you want to take medication, you're an adult, as long as you know the pros and the cons, feel free to do it. I don't have any problem with that. I hate to see people though, take medication that they really don't need because it's very easy to become dependent or addicted to these medications. And, and clearly uh, the antipsychotic medications are the most dangerous and, and ultimately pretty toxic if you take enough of it for a, a period of time. Uh, so, you know, medi medication uh, has some uses, but the way that we dispense it in our society is, <laughs> It's totally unnecessary. Uh, you know, people want to take it. They, they certainly will have no trouble getting it. Uh, and then I want to say something about mental health services in general. You know, there's what uh, I like to call the stagnant caseload problem with agencies or hospitals or wherever the service is being provided. And it has to do with medication because <clears throat> a clinician uh, who's going to provide therapy of some kind uh, is going to build up a caseload, people they have responsibility for. They have to keep records and, and uh, take care of these people. Now, it's frequently the case that the vast majority of time, the person, in addition to therapy, will get medication. Now, with, with medication, it could be the case that the person will take that medication for the long haul, year after year after year. Well, so they see that in, in many, many setups, they're gonna see the therapist and the psychiatrist at the same location or see, very close by. Now, uh, what ha then happens is new people who are having a crisis or have a real strong need to get some assistance can't get in for the services because the clinician's caseload is filled up with people who are taking medication long term. And so you end up with these wait lists. It's a, it's a huge problem. And then people start to think, well, we just don't have enough services available, but they don't really get into why you don't have those services. And, and uh, you know, it, it's uh, me medication is a huge moneymaker. Uh, and, and so I, I just wanted to point that out. And then finally, uh, the, the issue of, uh, Overcoming certain beliefs is a critical, critical issue for mental health. And obviously it, it's a problem in other areas. So if, you know, say somebody has a belief that they cannot uh, tolerate uh, uh, a certain situation, even they can't tolerate, uh, you know, visiting with people, something of this nature. Uh, and they have the option of staying away from people. This is going to cause them to suffer endless emotional pain because their needs aren't getting taken care of. And, 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 and again, with the hoarders, that is a very common problem. So they don't have the adequate emotional support. They don't have the community involvement, et cetera. And, and therefore they're gonna have constant emotional pain and they can take medication to partially anesthetize it. But again, the medication, it's a drug and people build up a tolerance to the drug 
and then they have to up the dosage or they have to give you a new medication. And the last thing I'm going to say, and, and uh, I'm not sure how prevalent it is right now because I've been removed from the trenches, uh, but one, one of the really outrageous things that happened was they started to push attention deficit hyperactivity disorder in children. And what they treated that with is, is essentially either Ritalin or Adderall, you know, just basically amphetamines <laughs> that if you were uh, pushing it out on the street, it would have been a felony and considered to be a, a significant addiction problem. Now, basically, uh, uh, what happens in some cases is, you know, say, say the child, uh, and, and of course, the school system functions to really force the hand of the parent to get the kids medicated. You know, the, probably the kids are, a lot of kids are coming to school. They haven't had breakfast. They, they might, you know, come to school eating sweets. They get, you know, blood sugar dysregulation problems. They have trouble uh, focusing. There's a lot of things that go on. They get identified as being a problem. The parent is called in and then they're given over to uh, a doctor to, who will prescribe, uh, say, Adderall. But here's what happens. So the kid takes the medication. It may be, you know, seven o'clock in the morning. Well, that medication is going to wear off as you get towards the end of the day. And when that medication wears off, the child is going to experience a little bit of withdrawal from the amphetamine, the Adderall. And, and they're gonna you know, start to have behavior problems or, or this kind of issue. So then what they do is they prescribe them, believe it or not, sometimes an antipsychotic medication so that the child can go to sleep at night. And, and the, 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 this is just a uh, uh, one example of how this system operates. And, and, uh, and, and our one, one more issue that I, I often bring up in a presentation, uh, what should happen if anybody's going in to get mental health services, you should go if you can afford it or you can find some way to get it, the blood work to identify if you have any micronutrient deficiencies. In other words, vitamins and minerals that your brain needs in order to have your neurotransmitters function in an effective way. Most of the time, people who come in for treatment, they never know what they're deficient in. And, and, and they start taking the medication. And, and of course, let, let's say you're somebody who has some pretty bad micronutrient deficiencies and then you go in for treatment, they're not gonna test you for that. Uh, all they're gonna do is you'll see a therapist or a case manager and you'll see a psychiatrist, they'll give you medication. But look what happens if you continue to have those nutritional deficiencies. You may like the therapist, you may like the therapy, uh, you may find the medication is somewhat helpful in terms of keeping your emotions in check, but the problem is you still have that uh, deficiency in terms of the nutrition. And, and therefore, after a while, you may find, well, you know, I like the therapy, uh, but, you know, I'm still having problems. I'm still having some problems that I can't really manage. I just can't get rid of the anxiety or whatever it is. And, and again, if we had a decent uh, mental health system, everybody would get tested for that going in. And then you may find out you don't even need the medication at all. What you really had was a, a nutritional deficiency. So anyway, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, present and uh, to have some communication with everybody. Uh, and again, I, I really respect this, uh, uh, this format, you know, where, where you have the presenter, you have the questions, and then you have the rebuttal, which gives everybody an opportunity to speak and, and to communicate. It's, it's really good. It's very 
rare to find anything like this, especially with the uh, you know kind of COVID semi lockdown or or the kind of the kind of thing that that's evolved. So, all right, that that's it. Uh, I'm done, and uh, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to leave. Uh, and uh, I will definitely make an effort to uh, be here next week and try try to show up in, in a reasonably regular fashion. I've forgotten how much I enjoy uh, the College of Complexes. So uh, anyway, everybody take care. I'm checking out. Thank you.